Welcome, Chair Lamont. Thank you. So we do have quorum and it is one o'clock, so we can begin. Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Planning Commission review session for Monday, October 4th, uh, 2021. The time is 1 p.m. and our quorum is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Alexandra Patty Diaz. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is an application for some land use actions to facilitate the development of a six story mixed use building in East New York. Next. The applicant on Monte Lincoln LLC is requesting a Sony map amendment and a Sony tax amendment in Community District 5. Next. Community District 5 of Brooklyn. Next. The project area has a frontage along Sutter Avenue and is bounded by Lincoln Avenue to the east and Alton Avenue to the west. The surrounding land use is predominantly a mix of residential uses consisting of attached and semi-detached multifamily walk-up buildings, one, two family houses. And the area is within an R5 uh, and R6 uh, districts. Commercial uses in the surrounding area include local retail such as car wash, automobile service, station, grocery stores, and eating and drinking establishments. Next. To the southeast of the development site, uh, there's a 3.5 acre New York City Transit Authority Pitkin Yard Maintenance Facility and the Linden Plaza and Towers Apartment Complex constructed above the rail yard, which consists of five 20 story mixed use commercial and residential uh, buildings. Public institutions include a 210 unit adult care and some public schools. Open space include the three acre Robert Benable Park immediately to the east of the project area and the grassy median of Conduit Boulevard located to the east of the project area which is also within the transit zone and is well served by public transit. The AC subway line runs along Pitkin Avenue with stations at Euclid Avenue and Grant Avenue within half a mile of the project area. B14, B15, BM5 and B20 also serve the project area. Next which is located on block 4254 and on the northern block frontage of Sutter Avenue between Lincoln and Anton Avenues and consists of approximately 18,000 square feet, which includes the development sites, uh, lots 41 and 39, and the adjacent lots blocks uh, 1, 4, 44, and 45. Next. Lots 144 and 45 are improved with a two story to family residences. Next, lot four is an interior lot used as a parking lot. Next, and lot 39 and 41, which compose the development site, are improved with a one story building constructed in 1977. That is used as a that has been used as a dry cleaning establishment, beauty salon, eating a drinking establishment, and an auto repair service. The south side of the lot contains an asphalt paved parking and storage area. Next, the applicant proposes to build a new six-story mixed-use residential and commercial building with a total floor area of 31,600 square feet. The proposed development will contain 7,400 square feet of commercial floor area on the ground floor for two retail spaces and 24,100 square feet of residential floor area producing 28 apartments. The cellar will consist of four 4,100 square feet of accessory residential parking, as well as accessory storage and utilities. The 10 accessory residential parkings are required. Um, the, commercial, the required commercial parking spaces are being waived. Next. 
The proposed development will have a height of approximately 55 feet with a portion of a building located within 25 feet of the adjoining R5 district, stepping down to a height of 40 five feet. An eight-foot side yard will be provided. Approximately 6,000 square feet of outdoor recreation space will be located on the roof and accessible to all residents of the building. Next. In order to facilitate this development, the applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment to change the existing R5 district uh, for an R6A C2 for commercial um, districts. Sorry, R6A and a C24 district. The existing R5 district is a non contextual residential district that permits most residential uses and community facility uses within an FAR of 1.25 and a community facility FAR of 2. 55 lot coverage and a maximum perimeter wall of 30 feet and a maximum building height of 40 feet. The proposed R6A is a contextual district and, is a, and facilitates medium density contextual buildings that allow residential uses of all types and as well as community facilities within a total FAR of 3.0. The maximum street wall height is between 40 and 65 feet, above which the building must set back and may raise to a height of 75 feet. The C2 commercial overlay allows, as you know, up to two point FAR of local, local retail uses in a standalone commercial building or in the ground floor of a mixed use development. Next. The applicant is requesting a zoning tax amendment to establish a new MIH area in the community district five with options one and two that is coterminous with the rezoning area. Next. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Patty. Um, questions from the commission. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Alexandra, thank you. Uh, I noticed that the uh, applicant has indicated uh, an intention to uh, designate option two of the M uh, MIH uh, program. Uh, which, as you know, is 80% area median income. How does that line up with the local AMI within that uh, community board? Yeah, the local AMI, uh, AMI is 38,000. And this is a usual breakup that we see in this type of development. Uh, but I think the applicant can uh, expand on the subsidies and the plan of affordability for the project in the public hearing. Yeah, it would seem that option one is more in line with uh, the uh, local AMI. Thank you. Are there other questions from the commission? Oh, Loretta? Yes. Hi, Alexandra. So, you know, I note that the, the context on the street is, is decidedly residential, although you know, these buildings do have, um, you know, history and legacy of commercial. Um, could you speak to context and why, you know, commercial overlay here uh, makes sense? Yeah. Um, one important factor with this uh, proposed rezoning, when, when we look into the ground, is the ground floor uses uh, on the Linden Terrace are on the opposite uh, corner. Uh, where the project area is located. Um, there are retail uses um, that are active and serving not only the residents of those towers, but also the residents of the local area. We have also seen, as you point out, that Solar Avenue, it, it has like scattered commercial uses uh, throughout and especially in this portion. And seeing that from the department's perspective, um, Within that the the location to enhance the retail and commercial activity on this corner would only would not only serve the residents of the proposed development and the area, but at the same time um, the residents of the Linden Towers um, on the what Linden is the Towers. What distance to Linden Towers? I mean, it's, I'm looking a, at a map. Is the opposite corner um, above the rail yard 
uh, above the rail yard. Um, there are five towers oh, of 20 stories each. Um, and they're now, also- Linden sorry. Towers is, has retail pretty much on the ground floor. That's the fine fair that's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the other thing to consider, and I think the applicant can explain this uh, further in the public hearing, is that uh, they, they are in the business of the supermarkets. And I think uh, it's their intention to add um, this type of business, uh, to have the option of add this type of business in the proposed development, um, which is in line with the designation of East New York as an area that needs more supermarkets to provide access to food. Mm -hmm. And remind me how much square footage they're looking at here? Um, in the in the retail or the whole building? The retail. The retail. The retail. Uh, Sorry, they are they, no, you're good. I have it here. Uh, it will contain 7,400 square feet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Okay. If not, this item is certified. The second item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 6. Um, our presenter, I believe for the first time with the City Planning Commission is Sarah Avila. Good afternoon, commissioners. Today I will be presenting 9881 Queens Boulevard rezoning. Next slide. This is a private application by Trilon LLC proposing two actions. The proposed actions are a zoning map amendment to change a R71 C12 zoning district to an R8X C24 zoning district and a zoning text amendment to map an MIH area coterminous with the rezoning area. The proposed development would be a 15 story mixed use 153,400 square foot development, including approximately 158 dwelling units with 136,000 square feet of residential floor area and 17,400 square feet of commercial floor area at 9881 Queens Boulevard, Rigo Park, Queens Community District 6. Next slide. The project area is comprised of block 2105, lots 1, 10, 14, and 16. The project fronts on Queens Boulevard, a major thoroughfare. The project area is generally bounded by Queens Boulevard, a wide street to the south, 66th Avenue to the west, 99th Street, a wide street to the north, and 66th Road to the east. The project rezoning area is 21,472 square feet. The project is located on the EFMR lines and between two MTA stations, the 67th Avenue station, two blocks to the east, and the 63rd Rigo uh, Park uh, station, five blocks to the west. For bus service, the Q60 makes stops along Queens Boulevard at 67th Avenue, as well as express bus service lines. The QM11 was serviced to downtown Manhattan, and the QM18 was serviced to midtown Manhattan. The Forest Hills Long Island Railroad Station is one mile east of the development site. Queens Boulevard is six lanes wide with two uh, service roads and protected bike lanes going east and west. Queens Boulevard itself is lined with apartment buildings rising between six and 13 stories and some older two-story commercial buildings. Within 10 blocks are, are also buildings that rise between 13 and 30 stories. Also in the area is Rigo Center, Rigo Park Plaza, to the north is Long Island Jewish Forest Hills Hospital, Forest Hills High School, and the southern end of Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Next slide. The rezoning area and surrounding area are in a large R71 zoning district. Queens Boulevard is also lined with C12 commercial overlays. Also nearby are two separate R4B zoning districts, which coincide with the clusters of attached one and two family homes in the area. These two zoning districts are located to the northeast near 65th Road and to the south of Queens Boulevard between 66th and 67th Avenues. The surrounding area contains a mix of community facility uses as well. Two blocks to the northeast is Long Island Jewish Forest Hills Hospital. Also, there are other healthcare facilities on Queens Boulevard to the east and to the west. 
The majority of structures on the project site are predominantly underbuilt one and two story commercial buildings, including a uh, restaurant, a uh, grocery store, um, house of worship, and other local retail. The project area is within the transit zone and according to the applicant team is an appropriate location for the additional density proposed. Next slide. Okay, uh, the next uh, slide is uh, the site area photos and we'll provide additional context of the existing conditions on site. Photos one, two, and three show the project area facing north, northwest, and southeast from Queens Boulevard. Queens Boulevard is a major thoroughfare, uh, 200 foot wide street going east and west. In photo one, you can see the eating and drinking establishment and some of the local retail uses along Queens Boulevard. Next slide. Photos uh, four, five, and six provide additional context facing southeast and northeast from Queens Boulevard. Um, once again, showing the existing local retail. In photo four, you can see the house of worship on the mid block. Next slide. Photos seven, eight, and nine show the project area facing northwest and the view of Queens Boulevard facing southeast and northwest from the development site. Next slide. The applicant is proposing a 15 story mixed use development with 136,000 square feet of residential floor area and 17,400 square feet of commercial floor area. The building would include 158 dwelling units, 110 at market rate, and 48 affordable units under MIH option two. 45 accessory parking spaces would be located on the second floor level. The building would have an FAR of 7.16. 6.35 FAR for residential and 0.81 FAR for commercial. The max FAR under RAX with MIH is 7.2. Next slide. The applicants are proposing three commercial units on the ground floor. Also on the ground floor would be a commercial lobby and parking would be accessible via a single curb cut on 99th Street. The residential lobby will be accessible via 66th Avenue. Next slide. There would be um, parking on the second floor accessible via a single curb cut on 99th Street. And through the ramp up, there will be 45 accessory parking spaces on the second floor level. The applicants are proposing a parking attendant area on the entrance on 99th Street. Next slide. The applicants are proposing 158 dwelling units on floors three through 15 with the proposed breakdown as follows. 40 uh, studio units, 74 one bedrooms, 32 bedrooms and 14 three bedrooms for a total of 158 dwelling units, 110 at market rate and 48 affordable units. Next slide. Um, this is a view of the proposed development along Queens Boulevard. There would be a setback after 104 feet on the ninth floor. The max base height under RAX with MIH is 105 feet and the max building height is 175 feet. The applicants are proposing a base height of 104 feet and a max building height of 174 feet. Next slide. The proposed zoning map amendment is to change a R71C12 zoning district to an RAXC24 zoning district on block 2105, lots 1, 10, 14, and 16. Next slide. The applicants are also requesting a zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area. Their application seeks to map MIH options one and two. The applicant is proposing 158 dwelling units. There would be 110 units at market rate, 48 units under MIH option two, or 30% with a residential floor area. Under MIH option one, it would be 40 units or 25% with residential floor area. Next slide. To summarize, this is a private application by Trilon LLC for a zoning map amendment and zoning tax amendment to facilitate a new 15 story mixed use, 153,400 square foot development, including approximately 158 dwelling units with 136,000 square feet of residential floor area and 17,400 square feet of commercial floor area in Rigo Park, Queens Community District 6. The applicants are proposing two actions, a zoning map amendment to change an R71C12 zoning district to RAXC24 zoning district, and a zoning text amendment to map an MIH area coterminous with the rezoning area. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, questions from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Marie. Good afternoon, and thank you. So I have, I have uh, maybe two or three questions. The first is, is there any, um, 
I would like to have the applicant, if he will, if they will, please identify out of the 48 uh, affordable units the breakdown per unit size. So how many studios, ones, twos, and threes within the 48 for the uh, the affordable uh, component? The second is just a question about the um, parking itself, because from the rendering there, it doesn't appear, I, I understand it's on the second floor, but from the rendering that's shown, it doesn't identify it to be uh, sort of a parking garage. I don't see fenestration um, for the garage. It looks like it's glazing like the rest of the building. So it's a, a, a clarification on the location and the treatment of the parking area would be um, helpful. And the only other question I would pose is of the 30% affordable unit set, I believe it's the 80% category, if I'm not mistaken there, on average, is that uh, in, 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 uh, in parallel with the AMIs of the community and the desires of the community? So the AMI for this community district is uh, uh, 74,636, um, that's for uh, Queens Community District 6, and for Queens it's 64,987. Um, as for the parking and the rendering, we can follow up with the applicant um, and also request that the architect attend a future public hearing. And um, as far as the breakdown of the MIH units, we will um, request additional uh, context from the applicants. So just a little more detail on the, on the, I understand what the AMIs are for the community. Uh, in terms of percentages, how does that play um, into percentages and how does that parallel with the, the AMIs pre presented for consideration? Sarah, we can get a breakdown of the, of the, um, like the 80% AMI and the, and the family size yeah, as I, well. We can, give a, we can give a little more breakdown of, to that, um, especially in light of the, um, your request for unit size and affordability levels. So Correct. Thank you. Sort Ryan. of all line up that. for you. Yeah. We'll follow up with that. Thank you. That's a good question. I think we also will follow up on the the parking question of how that's shown because it is true that the 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 rendering didn't show us clearly how that would be. Okay. Thank you, um, Commissioner Rompershell. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Actually, I actually had similar questions uh, that Commissioner Marin had brought up. I uh, just want to go one step further with regards to the parking. Uh, you said it is attended parking. I'm just wondering, are they going to have enough queuing at the ground level? Because 99th Street is a very busy street. I know the area very well. I live a few minutes away from there. So I was just curious if they can just clarify a little further how that's going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we'll follow up with the applicant to get a detailed uh, parking plan for the uh, and also a more up-to-date uh, rendering for the second floor parking. Any additional questions? If not, this item is certified. The uh, third item on our agenda is a certification of a city map amendment in the Bronx, Community District 6. Our presenter is Philip Montgomery. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> for certification, I have an application by a private applicant 420 Morris Park Avenue, LLC, seeking an amendment to the city map. The proposed amendment involves the elimination, discontinuance, and closing of East 178th Street, east of Morris Park Avenue, in the West Farms neighborhood of the Bronx Community District 6. Excuse me. <clears throat> the proposed amendment would facilitate the future as of right development of the applicant's property. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The project site is located within an M11 zoning district. Land uses within 600 feet of the project site are predominantly mixed use and residential to the west of Morris Park Avenue and commercial manufacturing and transportation to the east of Morris Park Avenue. The surrounding area is well served by public transportation, <coughs> including the East 180th Street 2 and 5 subway station located approximately a quarter mile to the north of the project area. Uh, there are also several local bus lines, including the BX36, BX M10 and the BX40. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the subject portion of East 178th Street is city owned and mapped to a width of 60 feet. 
It terminates in a cul-de-sac approximately 235 feet east of Morris Park Avenue. It is not open and in use as a street and is currently enclosed by fencing and used as parking by adjacent owners. Uh, the area proposed to be demapped and acquired by the applicant is approximately 18,400 square feet. <clears throat> the applicant's property to the north of the portion of East 178th Street proposed to be demapped is an irregular shape lot of approximately 25,500 square feet. Uh, the property was previously developed with a two-story building built in the 1950s as a kennel and occupied by the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. In or around 1982, the building was vacated by the ASPCA and was occupied as a food storage warehouse uh, prior to the applicant's purchase of the property in 2005. Uh, the two-story building was demolished in or around 2008. Currently, the site is a paved lot enclosed by chain link fencing that is currently leased to Con Ed for parking. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a bird's eye view of the project area. Uh, you can see the applicant's uh, property outlined in yellow and uh, uh, proposed street demapping area outlined in blue. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, here is a view of a conceptual site plan. Uh, while the applicant does not have a final development plan at this time, it would be as of right under the current M11 zoning district and is envisioned as two-story medical offices uh, shaded in gray. Uh, the applicant's use of the proposed street demapping area would be limited uh, to surface parking as a DEP has requested an easement on the area for below excuse me, for below grade infrastructure related to a DEP capital project to reduce combined sewer overflow into the Bronx River. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of the nor northern portion of the applicant's property taken from Morris Park Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a view of the applicant's property taken from Morris Park Avenue looking south. Next slide, please. Uh, another view of the applicant's property taken from Morris Park Avenue looking north. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, a picture of the portion of East 178th Street proposed to be demapped, uh, also taken from Morris Park Avenue. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take your questions. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, I would just ask if I understand correctly, this um, uh, area is currently being used by Con Ed for parking and would be proposed to be used by the applicant just for parking. So why do we have to go through the exercise of demapping? Well, the, the applicant's property is being used by Con Ed, not the portion. Oh, I misunderstood. Okay. Sorry, sorry okay. if I wasn't clear. Okay. That. But it would continue to be owned by the city and leased to the applicant? Is that it? Or was the, is the applicant going to acquire the demapped portion? The applicant is proposing to acquire the demapped portion. Okay. Okay. In a negotiated transaction with correct. the city. Correct. Yes, correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any additional questions? Seeing no raised hands, I'll say this is certified. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. The fourth item on our agenda is a non ULERP referral of an authorization in Queens Community District 5. Uh, presenting for the first time to the City Planning Commission is Luis Garcia Martinez. Good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide, please. This is a private application by 1718 Decatur LLC for a zoning authorization pursuant to zoning resolution section 4247 to allow a new residential use in an existing M14D zoning district. The actions would facilitate the development of a new three story residential building consisting of approximately 7,000 square feet containing six dwelling units at 1718 Decatur Street in Community District 5, Queens. Next slide, please. The project area is located in the southern portion of the Richwood neighborhood in Queens Community District 5. Richwood borders the neighborhoods of Maspeth, Middle Village, and Glendale, as well as the neighborhoods, um, the Brooklyn neighborhoods of East Williamsburg to the west and Bushwick to the southwest. In addition, a large cemetery belt is located directly to the side of the neighborhood, including Nullwood Cemetery and Trinity Cemetery, among others. Next slide, please. The project area is located in an existing M14D district at the intersection of light industrial and residential zones. The M14D zoning district extends north to Middle Avenue along Decatur Street 
and west to Hancock Street. The project area is located one block north of the Ridgewood IVZ and two blocks north from another zoning authorization application on 1112 Wyckoff Avenue. In 2012, the City Planning Commission authorized a new two-family residential building in the M14D district at 1611 Norman Street, approximately two blocks southwest of the project area. There have been no, authorization, no other authorizations for new residential uses within the M14D district in Southeast Ridgewood since then. Next slide, please. The project area is surrounded by a mix of residential, commercial, light industrial, and community facility uses, and is predominantly mapped with low to medium density contextual residential districts and low density industrial districts, including M14, R41, R5B, and R6B. M14D districts permit light industrial and commercial uses, as well as residential use by city planning commissioners authorization. For residential uses in M140 districts, the maximum FAR is 1.65 and the maximum building height is 32 feet. For commercial and industrial uses, the maximum FAR is 2.0. Next slide, please. The area to the west of Decatur Street is characterized by residential uses, including low rise one and two family buildings and small multifamily walk ups, ranging from three to four stories. The area to the south of Cypress Avenue is characterized by a mix of residential and manufacturing uses. To the north, the project area is characterized by one and two story warehouses that primarily contain construction uses. Nearby public facilities include PS068 Cambridge and the Evergreen Park to the east, and IS77 and PS239 to the west of the project area. Several cemeteries can be found to the east and south of the surrounding area. Next slide, please. The project area is located within the transit zone and is well served by public transportation, including the Halsey Street subway station with access to the L train, which is located approximately one third of a mile to the southwest of the project area, and the middle Wyckoff subway station with access to the L and M trains at approximately three quarters of a mile west of the project area. Several local bus routes, including the B20, B26, and B60 with service to Ridgewood, East New York, downtown Brooklyn and Williamsburg are also located within the surrounding area. Next slide, please. The project area proposed development site located at 1718 Decatur Street, Arco Terminus and cons consists of lot 26, block 3568. The 4,246 square foot interior lot is bounded by Seneca Avenue to the north, the elevated LIRR rail line to the east, Cypress Avenue to the south and Decatur Street to the west. The project area has 25 feet of frontage on Decatur Street and is improved with a two-story, two-family residential building that was constructed in 1915. Now other properties are affected by the, the requested zoning authorization. Next slide, please. Here you can see views of the site facing southeast, northeast, and east of a scene from Decatur Street. On the image of the top right, you can observe the tree-lined section of Cater Street with predominant residential uses on both sides of the street. Next slide, please. Here you can see views of the northwest side of Cater Street, where we can appreciate one and two family buildings and small multifamily walk-ups ranging from two to three stories. Next slide, please. The proposed action was facilitate the development of a three-story apartment building with six residential units that would contain approximately 7,000 square feet of floor area with an FAR of 1.65. The proposed building would be 25 feet in width, 94 feet in length, and 32 feet in height. The building's street wall would align with the adjacent building to the north and provide a 65-foot rear yard. No parking would be provided as residential parking is not permitted unless it's authorized by the commission in accordance with zoning resolution section 4228B. Next slide, please. Residential uses are not per permitted as of right within M1D districts, but in accordance with section 4247 of the zoning resolution, new residences or, or enlargements may be permitted in M14D zoning districts by authorization of the city planning commission in certain cases. On zoning lots containing residential or commercial facility uses, new residences or enlargements of existing residences 
may be authorized provided that one, the zoning law contains a building that has one or more stories of local residential or community facility uses, and no more than one story of commercial or manufacturing uses therein. Two, the zoning lot contains no other commercial or manufacturing uses. And three, 25% or more of the aggregated length of the block fronts on both sides of the street facing each other is occupied by zoning lots containing residential uses. Next slide, please. In authorizing such residential uses, the commission shall find that, um, one, the residential uses will not be exposed to adverse impacts such as excessive noise, smoke, dust, and toxic materials from current or previous commercial or manufacturing uses. Two, there are no open uses listed in use group 18 within 400 feet of the zoning lot. Three, the residential uses will not adversely affect commercial or manufacturing uses in the district. And four, the authorization will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the use is located. Next slide, please. In terms of meeting the eligibility requirements for zoning resolution section 40 to 47, the zoning lot is currently occupied by, the res by residential use and does not contain any commercial or manufacturing uses. In addition, the development is site exceeds the 25% residential and community facility block front length requirement with an aggregated residential and community facility frontage of 845 feet or 83% of the total. Next slide, please. As detailed in the applicant's statement of findings, pursuant to the proposed development's environmental assessment statement, there will be no adverse noise or quality, air quality impacts on the surrounding area caused by the proposed development or previous commercial or manufacturing uses. There is only one manufacturing site within 400 feet of the zoning lot with an active DEP industrial permit. This site is used for wood working, corresponding to use group 17, and activities are located in an enclosed building. Regarding the prohibition of use group 18, open uses within 400 feet of the zoning lot, there are no open uses within 400 feet of the zoning lot listed under use group 18. Lastly, the applicant finds that the authorization would not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the use is located, nor impair the future use of development or development of commercial or manufacturing zoning lots. Next slide, please. In conclusion, 1718 Decatur LLC requests a zoning authorization pursuant to zoning resolution section 4247 to facilitate the development of a new 7,000 square foot, three-story residential building with six dwelling units in an existing M14D zoning district on 1718 Decatur Street in Ridgewood, Queens. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Luis. Are there any questions from the commission? If not, this item will be referred to the community board for 45 days. Uh, the fifth item on our agenda is a non yielder referral of an authorization in Queens Community District 5. Uh, Luis will present again. Hi, good afternoon. This is a private application by 1112 Holdings LLC for a signing authorization pursuant to zoning resolution 4247 to allow a new residential use in an existing M14D zoning district. The actions would facilitate the development of a new three-story mixed-use building of approximately 9,945 square feet, including 1,200 square feet of commercial floor area on the ground floor, and 8,745 square feet of residential floor area with approximately 10 residential dwelling units, at 1112 White of Avenue in Community District 5, Queens. Next slide, please. The Prairie area is located in the southern portion of Ridgewood, previously described in the last presentation. Next slide, please. The Prairie area is located in an existing M140 district two blocks south from the previous presented zoning authorization application on 1718 Decatur Street and approximately two blocks east from the two-family residential building at 1611 Norman Street, authorized by the City Planning Commission in 2012. Next slide, please. The surrounding area is the same as described in the previous application and is mapped with a mix of residential, commercial, industrial, and community facility uses. Next slide, please. In this immediate surrounding area, two blocks south of the previous project, Mixed residential buildings with ground floor commercial uses are located along Wyckoff Avenue, 
Um, these mixed-use buildings range from three to four stories, and local retail uses include delis, a coffee shop, and a bar. Additional, additional light industrial uses are located to the east of the project site along Wyckoff Avenue and Cooper Avenue. These are generally located in one-story buildings and include auto repair, iron work, and woodwork shops. Next slide, please. The project area is well served by public transportation, including the Kelsey Subway uh, Street subway station and the middle Wyckoff subway station with access to the L and M trains. Several local bus routes, including the B20, B26, and B60 are also located within the surrounding area. Next slide, please. The project area and proposed development site located at 1112 Wyckoff Avenue are coterminous and consist of Lot 44, Block 3542 within the M14D zoning district. The 5,302 square foot interior lot is bounded by Wyckoff Avenue to the north, Cooper Avenue to the east, Irving Avenue to the south, and Decatur Street to the west. The project area has 53 feet of frontage on Wyckoff Avenue, a 60 foot, a 60 foot wide street with two way traffic and has been occupied by a two-story, two-family residential building since 1975. No other properties are affected by the requested zoning authorization. Next slide, please. Here you can see a view of this uh, site facing south and southwest from Wyckoff Avenue, and a view of Wyckoff Avenue facing southeast with a site to the right. Next slide, please. Here you can see a view of lots four, seven, nine, and 10 on block 3556 directly across from the site facing northeast from Wyckoff Avenue and the lot adjacent to the, develop to the development site. We can also observe the predominant mixed use identity of the area with some mixed residential buildings with ground floor commercial uses. Next slide, please. The proposed action would facilitate the development of a three-story mixed use building with 1,200 square feet of ground floor commercial retail use and 10 residential units. The proposed building would be 52 feet in width, 68 feet in length, and 32 feet in height. The building would be set at the, at the street line and provide a 31 foot rear yard. The total floor area of the building is 9,950 square feet, which result in 1.88 FAR. No commercial parking would be provided as residential parking is not permitted unless it's authorized by the commission. Next slide, please. Residential uses are not permitted as of right within M1D districts, but in accordance with section 4247 of the zoning resolution, new residences may be permitted in M14D zoning districts by authorization of the city planning commission in certain cases. On zoning lots containing residential uses, new residences or, or enlargements may be authorized provided that the zoning lot contains a building with residential or community facility uses and at least 25% of the block front of the street occupied by zoning lots containing are occupied by zoning lots containing residential uses. Next slide, please. In, also, in authorizing such residential uses, the commission shall find that the residential uses shall will not be exposed to adverse impacts from commercial or manufacturing uses, that there are no use, uses listed in, group, in use group 18 within 400 feet of the lot, and the residential uses will not adversely affect other uses in the district nor alter the character of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. In terms of meeting the legitimacy requirements per section 4247 of the zoning resolution, the zoning lot is currently occupied by residential, by residential uses and does not contain any commercial or manufacturing uses. In addition, the development site exceeds the 25% residential and community facility block front length requirement with an aggregated residential and community facility frontage of 192 feet or 54% of the total. Next slide, please. As detailed in the applicant's statement of findings pursuant to the proposed development's environmental assessment statement, there will be no adverse noise or air quality impacts in the surrounding area caused by the proposed development or previous commercial or manufacturing uses. Regarding the provision of use group 18, open uses within 400 feet of the zoning lot, there are no open uses within 400 feet of the zoning lot listed under use group 18. The light industrial and manufacturing uses in the surrounding area are generally limited to use group 16 and 17 that emit limited amount of noise, smoke, smoke, dust, and odors. These include storage facilities, warehouses, and automotive repair shops, as well as supply, a supply yard and a metal fabrication shop. 
Lastly, the potential development of a mixed-use residential and commercial building will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the use is located, nor impair the future use of, or development of commercial or manufacturing zoning lots. Next slide, please. In conclusion, 1112 Holdings LLC requests a zoning authorization pursuant to zoning resolution section 4247 to facilitate the development of a new 9,945 square foot, three-story mixed-use development, including 1,200 square feet of commercial floor area on the ground floor and 10 dwelling units in an existing M14D zoning district on 1112 Wyckoff Avenue in Richwood, Queens. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you again, Luis. And it is not every day that we see these authorizations, uh, two in one neighborhood, not even the same owner, which I asked the other day to make sure, but we have them. Any questions from the commission? Well, if not, this item will also be referred to the community board for 45 days. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Okay. The sixth item on our agenda is a non ULERP referral of an authorization in Manhattan Community District 5. Our presenter is Jose Trucius. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is our first Elevate Transit Sony for Accessibility or CFA application. Um, next slide, please. This is a private application introduced by POB 57 LLC for a zoning authorization pursuant to section. 66511 of the Sonar Resolution to allow for the util utilization of additional floor area for mass transit station improvements. The action will facilitate the development of a 63-story mixed-use building standing at 1,100 feet of um, height with approximately 300,000 square footage of total floor area and within 33 residential units and 137 hotel keys located in Midtown Manhattan, Community District 5. If approved, the authorization will permit an increase in the amount of floor area for the proposed building by 53,029 square feet. Next slide, please. The proposed development is located in at one, one, uh, 4147 West 57th Street within the special Midtown District. The majority of the development site is in a C5 2.5 and C53 zoning districts within the Midtown Special District. And the remaining portion is in the C51 zoning district, which is outside the special district. It includes block 1273 and lots 7, 9, 10, and 65. The site is an irregular shape through lot on a block bounded by West 57th Street, 5th Avenue. West 57th Street and 6th Avenue. The development site and the zoning lot are one of the same, and the proposed granting station is located at West 57th and 6th Avenue, serving the F line west of the site. The surrounding area is well served by public transportation, and nevertheless, the granting stations does not have ADA accessibility. Next slide. The surrounding area is home to work right now hotels, department stores, jewelry stores, concert halls offices and residential buildings. It's generally characterized uh, by a mix of high density commercial and residential uses. Um, Sixth Avenue is lined with high rise commercial office buildings and mixed use buildings with retail uses on the ground and lower floors. Um, while tall residential and hotel buildings are located along West 57th Street and West 53th Street. Next slide. There are multiple open spaces surrounding the area, the most notable being Central Park, just north of the development site. There are also 23 privately owned public spaces um, and including three combined plazas and arcades within a block of the development site. As August of this year, the demolition has been completed and the lots are now raised and the entire project size lies empty. Next slide. The City Planning Commission voted to approve Sony for accessibility. On September 1st of this year, the text expands the tools available to achieve accessible subway and elevate rail service. As it pertains to this application, CFA has replaced section 74634 special permit, which is the former subway improvement bonus. Pursuant to Sonar Resolution 66511, since all three districts have residential district equivalent to an R10 district, 
and the proposed station being just 170 feet from the development site, the application qualify as a qualifying transit improvement site. I'll get into more of that into the details in a little bit later. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, um, the zoning lot um, is split in three zoning districts. Um, uh, the, the zoning lot shown here in the dash red line has a gross floor area of approximately 20,000 square feet with approximately 75 of frontage along West 58th Street, which is a narrow street and approximately 170 of frontage along West 57th Street, a wide street. The tax, lot, the tax lots will be merged into a single tax uh, lot before the construction of the proposed building. Um, approval of this authorization will result in a blended maximum floor area bonus of 2.75 FR, which is equivalent to the 53,029 square footage total floor area described earlier. Next slide, please. In the as a rise scenario, the development site will be developed with a building that contains a total of approximately 266 thousand total floor area, including approximately 143,000 residential space and 123,000 of commercial space. The residential, the residential space will include 33 dwelling units and the commercial space will include a hotel with 137 hotel keys. With a maximum height of 63 stories and a 1,100 feet, including the bolt head and an FAR of 13.8, which maximizes the FAR under the 16th zoning districts. Next slide. And the additional floor area will allow the proposed development to approximately get up to 144,000 of commercial space and 174,000 of residential space, which is a, uh, an approximately a total floor area 318 square feet at a 16.53 FAR. As you can see here on the right, the proposed development will contain retail space located in the cellar ground floor um, level, 137 hotel keys on the second to 20th floor and 33 residential units between the 21st, the 21st to the 58th floors. Uh, dedicated mechanical room, room, uh, room uh, floors will be located on the third, 21st, 33rd and 45th floors. And a mechanical ball head will be equivalent of a six floors. No parking is required and none will be provided for any of the proposed uses. Uh, the SRI and, and the proposed with action scenarios have the overall building high uh, as they're similar and similar program with the section of bulkier building resulting in larger hotel and residential lobbies. Next slide. To further illustrate um, the similarity between the no action and with action scenarios, um, the authorization was on a blended maximum floor area, as I mentioned, of 2.75 FAR. The new action and reaction conditions depicted in this figure represent two possible building designs that maximize the permitted floor area consistent with bulk in FAR regulations. The proposed action will not result in an increase in building height, and approval of the action will alter only the received portion of the east and west uh, facing facades. The exterior envelope of the building will not change. Uh, the biggest difference to highlight here is that in the no actions condition or scenario, the proposed station improvements, uh, the F trains will not be made. Um, next slide, please. The granting extension is located at West 57th Street and 6th Avenue, with entrances on West 56th and West 57th Streets on the east and uh, west side serving the F line. The uh, its eastern footprint ends approximately 170 feet west of the development site. Next slide. In 2019, the Enhanced sta Station Initiative Program implemented aesthetics and technological upgrades to the granting station. In addition, a third foot section of the platform was elevated for ADA accessibility compliance. Despite these improvements, no elevators or escalators serve the station, and the, um, the granting station remained no ADA accessible from the street to the mezzanine and to the mezzanine to the platform levels. Uh, the most recent ID accessible station just opened in June of this year, located at West 57th Street and 7th Avenue, serving the N, W, Q, and R lines. It's just beyond outside the surrounding area on a four, five minute walk. Uh, the development site, as I mentioned earlier, is 170 away, uh, 70 feet away from the granting station. And that means that the C2.5 and the C53 zoning district portion are within the requirement for the authorization for transit improvements, we require them to fall within the 1,500 
of the granting station if located within the central business district. And they are. And while the F1, uh, F1 uh, uh, the C51 district portion of the development site is known as central business district, it also is less than 500 feet away from the granting station, meaning that the three zoning districts qualify for the bonus area um, generated here. Next slide, please. The applicant collaborated uh, with the NTA and the New York City Transfer Authority to define a scope of work uh, to increase the ADA accessibility and additional safety measures of the grant station. On August 24th of this year, the NTA issued a letter stating that um, the applicant had agreed, the NTA and the applicant had agreed to the station improvements that will, the NTA's view, justify the requested additional floor area bonus. The proposed improvements will include the construction of two elevators which will provide ADA access from the street to the mezzanine and the mezzanine to the platform, an elevator machine room serving both elevators, and the reconfiguration of the fare control line and, and a new automated fare car access gates to accommodate the mezzanine to platform levels and reduce con uh, congestion. Next slide. As of now, the mezzanine level contains the station master booth, fair machines, fair airways, and fair control areas, dividing pay and unpay areas, and the mechanical and electric rooms. The applicant proposed a reconfiguration of the fair control line and a new automated fair care access uh, gates to accommodate the mezzanine to platform elevator and aim to improve the circulation and reduce congestion of pedestrians. Next slide. Currently, access to the station from the street is provided by eight staircases to the mezzanine level, four on the east side um, of Sixth Avenue and four on the west side. The applicant proposed the construction of two elevators providing ADA access from the street to the mezzanine, again, and to the mezzanine to the platform levels. Next slide. Now, six staircases lead from the mezzanine level to the platform level. The platform level is a single island uh, with tracks on either side. The second elevator provides access from the mezzanine to the platform level, which is what's raised um, again, part of the, uh, the improvements in 2019, uh, but did not have any accessibility from the mezzanine to the, uh, to the platform level, as you recall, um, we elevator access. And uh, next slide, please. Here are the updated findings for Senate Res uh, Resolution 66511. The application meets the findings and all other associate, uh, associated requirements. Um, per a review of the department. Next slide, please. And to summarize, the applicant requests the maximum allowable bonus per Sony resolution 66511, which equals 20% of the additional floor area in exchange for the proposed station improvements, um, which is the granting station located at West 57th Street and 6th Avenue, serving the F line. The applicant and the NTA believe that the upgrades will improve circulation, reduce congestion, and make the station ADA accessible. The proposed improvement will increase the number of ADA accessible, accessible stations on the F line from 14 to 15 out of 45 stations, and in Manhattan from four to five, which is a 25% increase. The area is one of the most densely populated and highly developed areas in the city, drawing people from throughout the city and the world. The department supports this application and believes this improvement will benefit the public. At a time of presented challenge facing the hotel industry in New York, the department also plus direct investments to ensuring the revival of New York City's tourism sector. With that, I conclude my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, questions from the commission? Um, Commissioner Levin. All right, let me get geared up here. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, it's going to be terrific to get ADA access into this station. So um, this looks like a very significant um, project and one I can understand uh, uh, supporting. Um, it The images made me think of a, an issue that the commission looked at quite a number of years ago and we haven't heard about since, and that is uh, mechanical voids. And I realize this goes beyond the authorization that's before us now, but do you happen to know the dimensions of those four mechanical voids? Um, and do they fit within the previous work that we've done um, on that subject? Actually, I don't think we did any work in that area. I think we did it in other districts. 
Right. I can I can get back to you on that. Um, the, as far as from dimensions, I, I believe it's only what I have is that it will be equivalent to six floors. But in terms of like how dimensions will be, I can get back to you on that. I mean, a total of six floors or each void is the equivalent of six floors? Oh, no, the mechanical bulk hell is equivalent to six floors. So the entire- oh, the, the bulkhead. No, I'm asking about the voids in the build, the, the, oh. the voids go at intervals up the building. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, and we've had a pre previous situations where uh, voids um, appear to have been included, not just for mechanical purposes, but for the purpose of driving up the height of the building and therefore the value of the apartments on the tippy top. Um, mm -hmm. And we did some reform work um, on that in other zoning districts a while back. And I believe there was a push to include those reforms um, in these districts, but I don't believe we've taken that further. So. Just curious to know uh, how these voids will fit into those previous discussions. Okay. We will definitely follow up on that, Commissioner Levin. I will note that we did not follow up on that work in part because the pandemic led us to understand that there were other considerations that we needed to take into account in terms of, you know, ventilation and things in buildings that is right. at a heightened uh, degree now. So we will, though ensure that we understand what the issue is here. Excellent, thank you. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you. Uh, I noticed that, uh, that no parking is required uh, in this project. Uh, so I assume for uh, most or all of the towers that have been built on uh, West 57th Street uh, over the past decade, no, no parking has been required. Is that correct? The residential towers I'm speaking of, you know, that would, that would be my understanding. I am not an expert on the Manhattan core parking regulations, but um, that that's my understanding. Yeah, so I was just wondering, uh, you know, policy wise, is, is, is that based on the kind of Manhattan ethos that you want to discourage cars from coming in uh, to Midtown or on the uh, adequacy of, uh, of parking facilities in, in that neighborhood. I, I was just wondering the rationale for not requiring parking. Uh, I mean, I, I believe that there is also a, a rationale based on car ownership rates in some of these neighborhoods and he's nodding uh, there. And, and then the, the um, as, you, as you said, the um, sort of not wanting to encourage people to come in and, and park here? We absolutely can follow up though, uh, mm -hmm. Vice Chair mm -hmm. Knuckles, in terms of what the requirements are here and, and what they're grounded in. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have, we have some experts on that. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the commission? Well, if not, uh, we will say that this item will be referred to the community board for 45 days and that we're very, very happy to see this use of this new provision in the zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the seventh item on our agenda is a non Mueller referral of an authorization in Brooklyn Community District 1. Our presenter is Alexandra Patty Diaz. Hello again. This is a private application for some waterfront authorizations to facilitate an as of right development of approximately 600,000 square feet of mixed use development in Brooklyn. Next. The applicant, One Java Owners LLC, is seeking an authorization pursuant to CRC. 62822B to modify design requirements for the waterfront public access area. A related action, it's also seek a, a waterfront chairperson certification pursuant to CR section 62811. Next. The project area is located in Greenpoint neighborhood of Community District 1 in Brooklyn. Next. The development site is bounded by industry to the north, West Street to the east, Java Street to the south, and the East River to the west. The site is zoned a mix of R8 and R6 district with a C24 commercial overlay along West Street. Next. 
the total lot area of the development site is 233,000 square feet and is currently improved with a one-story industrial building on the upland portion of the site, which will be the mileage to facilitate the construction of the as of right building and the work from public access area. Next. The development site also includes the existing industry pier, which will remain in operation as ferry landing during and following the proposed development. Next. The proposed waterfront public access area will be approximately 22,800 square feet. Next will include 15,000 square feet of pier area on the industry pier. Next, approximately 7,600 square feet of short public walkway. Next, 4,000 square feet of supplemental public access area. Next, and a public access area to connect. Next. The applicant is proposing the following authorizations to facilitate the, de the design that responds to the unique conditions of uh, the development. Next. The applicant proposes to provide a screening buffer that is less than four feet in height and only 10% being evergreen species in order to allow visibility between the waterfront public access area and the adjacent outdoor terrace supporting um, the uses on the ground floor of the building. Next. The applicant proposes to provide a wooden guardrail surrounding the proposed Revo reveal, allowing um, for users of this area to lean on to see the river next, as well as to sit down and do other type of activities with a stain, uh, with this regard of the stainless steel um, that is uh, required. Um, within the zoning resolution. Next. And then on the same line, um, the applicant is requesting um, to preserve the existing non-compliant guardrail of the industry prior, which is designed contrary to a specific uh, that are set up on the WAP BK1. Next. In conclusion, the proposed uh, actions will facilitate the development of a 22,000 square feet of water from public access area in Community District 1, Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Are there any questions from the commission? Seeing none, this item will be referred to the community board for 45 days. Thanks. Okay, item eight on our agenda is a non Mueller pre hearing review of a request to form a business improvement district in the Bronx, community districts nine and 10. Uh, presenting uh, for his first time at the commission is Douglas Rose. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Doug Rose, and this is a pre hearing review session to establish a Castle Hill business improvement district. The applicant is New York City Department of Small Business Services on behalf of the proposed bid steering committee. Next slide, please. The proposed bid is in the south central section of the Bronx near Castle Hill and Parkchester neighborhoods. The proposed bid compromises 96 properties generally located on Castle Hill Avenue and Westchester Avenue, shown in blue on the top right diagram. Located in the center of the proposed bid area is Castle Hill Avenue six train stop. The bid area is a neighborhood commercial corridor made up of mostly smaller footprint, single story retail as pictured in the bottom right here with some properties that have second or third story residential. Additionally, there are a couple of six story apartment buildings with first floor commercial spaces. The district has mainly local businesses with a few national eateries and retailers. Of the district's 96 properties, 92 are partially or wholly commercial. 
Next slide, please. This slide covers the services provided by the bid along with its budget and funding model. So services provided by the bid would include marketing, holiday lighting, street cleaning, graffiti removal above and beyond what is already offered by the city. The bid would also coordinate and advocate on behalf of its members for improvements to the area. The bid's estimated first year annual budget would be $300,000 and the bid is funded through payments made by the bid's commercial property owners. The assessed contribution is predominantly based on the width of your property facing the street. Specifically, commercial and mixed-use properties will pay annually $55 per linear front foot. If a, property, if a property occupies a street corner, there's an additional $300 annual fee. The one purely residential property will pay a nominal $1 annual fee. Property devoted solely to public or not-for-profit uses are exempt and don't pay any fees. Next slide, please. This slide addresses the public outreach and support for the bid. So the bid application was led by a steering committee of 15 local community stakeholders who contacted local property owners, local businesses, residents starting in 2017. Outreach efforts included two public meetings, 26 steering committee meetings, distribution of 480 newsletters, and over 2,000 emails, one-on-one -on -one calls, and telephone calls. The steering committee's outreach efforts resulted in 54% of the commercial properties supporting the bids formation and 7% being unsupported. This means of those property owners within the district, the voice and opinion, 89% were in support of the bid's creation. The bid geography covers parts of community districts 9 and 10. The plan was referred out to both community boards. Both boards waived their public hearing, but indicated support for the bid's creation via letters to the Department of City Planning, which are in your briefing packets. A negative declaration was issued from the environmental assessment. Next slide, please. That concludes the presentation for the creation of the Castle Hill Business Improvement District. Uh, there'll be a public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Douglas. Okay, this will go to public hearing on Wednesday. Oh, sorry, Chair, Vice Chair Knuckles, you had a question. Can I can uh, certainly address it on Wednesday. I, I would just say I'm I'm very glad to see a a, a bid uh, proposal in this area. You know, historically a a robust retail area. I guess my only question would be the adequacy of the budget at three hundred thousand dollars. I would, of course, defer to Commissioner uh, Cerullo uh, in this area, but it would seem to me that just the uh, human resource. Uh, aspect of would constitute at least a third of $100,000. So I'm just wondering about the adequacy of the budget. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. So I guess two things, there are the three closest bids, Morris Park bid, Throgsneck bid, and Westchester Square bid all have budgets of three hundred dollars to $400,000. So this is within range of what is typical for this kind of neighborhood. Um, but yes, I can let the applicant speak more to the breakdown of costs and specifically overheads. Well, that's that's a meaningful statistic. So thank you for that. Thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, um, a, a little bit along the lines of um, Commissioner Knuckles. I'm, I'm curious about the context and, and you mentioned $55 per linear foot. Um, and you just offered the budgets for Westchester, Morris, and Throgs next. I'm not sure their size or scale. So maybe when uh, on Wednesday, if we could just get a sense of what what is that? Is that higher or that low, or is that about average? Um, you know, for not just right around there, but the Bronx and and uh, so I'll I'll leave it at that. And then the other is um, you mentioned the residential um, assessment, the nominal one dollar. Um, is that, does that assessment then mean that there will be residents that sit on the board? Could you just speak to the governance and the role that, you know, residents will play in helping make decisions for, for the district? Yeah, so with the second question about the governance, I'll let SBS answer that on Wednesday. I'll make sure they know to talk about that. 
for the first question about typical sizes and budgets. So the closest bids I mentioned have similar sizes in uh, financial terms. They, Morris Park and Throgs Neck bid both do the same thing about linear front foot. So based on width as the main assess assessment met method, um, Morris Park is $42 per linear foot and Throgs Neck is 36. So this is a little bit higher than that. Okay. But I would say That's that cool. those were created in the past. And so uh, accounting for inflation and whatnot, I'd say it's within normal ranges. Um, but SBS can provide more information on what's typical for the Bronx. Uh, you answered Wednesday. my question. Thank you. And on the residential, oh, you're going to let them answer on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Murray. Thank you. So, so my only question would be along the lines of both Commissioner um, Knuckles and um, Ortiz. And how many residences are affected here, and are they aware of this action? Yes, so there's only one purely residential property on the site, and then there are some mixed-use properties. Um, the residents are not being charged. It's only commercial front footage. Um, but in terms of outreach to residents, I'll let the applicant speak to that on Wednesday. So I'm a little bit confused then because you're saying the residences get charged a dollar and there's no charging of residences here. I'm, I'm a bit confused with that. Just one property. So one, one... one property is, is fully residential. So that property would be charged as fully residential. The rest, because they have a commercial obey, will be charged as commercial. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. That's, yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, obviously, the most relevant answers of, of, for these questions will come from the proposed bids team and from SBS. But just the, listening to the, the conversation, just a couple of thoughts about this. One is that the issue of the a bids budget is <laughs> this has come up before. The, the the degree to which the budget is sufficient, um, you, we will have to in some ways trust the bids, um, you know, the executive team that they put together to develop this. Um, no bid wants to be created and fail. Uh, so we can expect that they believe that what they're asking for, at least in round one at their creation, would be will be sufficient to manage through the beginning of their lives as a bid. Um, and also, we need to keep in mind that the budget process is an annual one and can be reviewed and and modified each year. Um, you know, with the support of the elected officials and, of course, the bid board and and uh, other city. Um, representatives, um, the idea of the residential, this is, you know, there, there are bids that actually residents are, are charged the same amount as commercial, or they have a different level. This is a policy issue that in, in bid creation has been around for probably close to 20 years now, where residents are not being charged we say not not being charged they're being charged a dollar but not uh, a, a comparable or 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 um a different level of assessment um even though residents are particularly in mixed-use neighborhoods are benefiting a great deal from the work that the bid is doing seven days a week um obviously the politics of of that play greater than the substance. And this is a way that residents have been able to participate in almost every district plan. And in fact, I believe in the legislation, residents are mandated to have a position on the board, regardless of whether or not they're paying an assessment or not, or it is a, a um, sort of a you know, the dollar that they may be playing. In fact, if I recall, when we did meatpacking, um, there were residents that were included in their governance that 
weren't even in the bid geography. They were just outside the bid geography to participate in that governance. So there's a lot about this area, but I think we, again, the answers to the questions uh, specifically will come from the bid, but generally speaking, um, this is sort of a community building effort and, and both business and it has business in its name, but it's really become a, a, a very full scale, you know, people who live, work and play um, in the neighborhoods. But uh, it doesn't sound to me that anything about this presentation or how the bid is looking to handle its beginnings should be of concern. But but again, we'll we'll get the real answers to the questions and how they relate to the bid from during the public hearing. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions? Hearing none, we will see this again on Wednesday at the public hearing. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, the ninth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments, uh, special permit and city map amendments, as well as a post-referral follow-up on some authorizations in Brooklyn Community District 1. Our presenter is Amritha Mahesh. Good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide, please. This is an application by River Street Partners LLC to facilitate a new 1.16 million square foot mixed-use development with 1,050 apartments including 263 affordable apartments, commercial space, community facility space, and waterfront public access areas in Williamsburg Community District 1, Brooklyn. Next slide. The applicant is requesting several land use actions, including a zoning map amendment, zoning text amendments, special permits, zoning authorizations, a landfill action, and a city map change. In addition, the applicant is seeking a waterfront chairperson certification. Next slide. The project area is located along the Williamsburg waterfront and includes three waterfront blocks roughly bounded by North 3rd Street and Grand Street that comprise the development site and two non-applicant owned upland blocks between North 1st and North 3rd Streets east of River Street. Directly to the north of the project area is the Austin Nichols House. To the south, uh, the project borders Grand Ferry Park and the New York Power Authority Nipa Peaker Plant. Adjacent developments also include North Side Piers and the Edge to the north, and the Domino development to the south. Further south is the Williamsburg Bridge. Next slide. The Williamsburg waterfront hosts residential and mixed use developments of 15 to 45 stories to the north and south. The upland blocks consist of elevator and walk up apartment buildings, converted residential loft buildings, and three to four story row houses. A variety of commercial, industrial, and entertainment and distribution uses are interspersed among these residences. Several playgrounds and parks are located near the project area including Grand Ferry Park, Domino Park, and a playground at PS84. The surrounding area is well served by public transportation, with transportation options including the L and G subway lines, several bus lines, and the East River Ferry. Next slide. The project area is located within an M31 heavy industrial district that has remained unchanged since 1961. Much of the waterfront north of the project area is mapped with a blend of R8 and R6 districts with C24 overlays, permitting residential and commercial uses and facilitating the development of uh, waterfront public access areas, while uh, the upland blocks are mapped with a combination of contextual mid-density residential districts and mixed-use districts. The waterfront immediately to the north of the project area is within the Greenpoint Williamsburg Waterfront Access Plan and has been developed with several acres of parks and public open space pursuant to the WAP. Next slide, please. Here are some photographs of the project area. To the left is the corner of River Street and Metropolitan Avenue looking south towards the Domino development. 
to the right, uh, the corner of River Street and North First Street, looking north. Next slide. To the left is an image of the existing in water structures as seen from the upland portion of the development site. To the right is the lot line condition along the Naipa plant at North First Street. Next slide. Here are some images looking down Metropolitan Avenue and North Third Street towards the waterfront and the neighboring Austin Nichols house. Next slide. And seen here are the non applicant controlled upland blocks. Block 2356 is, in, uh, is improved with a six story commercial building. Block 2362 includes two vacant lots. Lot 3 is owned by Con Edison. Next slide. As the Commission may recall, the applicant seeks to develop the site with a mix of residential, commercial, and community facility uses. The proposal includes two mixed use, predominantly residential, 64 and 49 story towers, with approximately 1,050 apartments, including 263 affordable apartments, and nearly 2.9 acres of waterfront open space. Next slide. The Northern Tower, Building A, is anticipated to include approximately 539,000 square feet of floor area, including 11,000 square feet of commercial space, 30,000 square feet of community facility space, and 498,000 square feet of residential space. A YMCA is proposed as the community facility use and would be located on the second and third floors. Building A would rise to a height of approximately 560 feet. The Southern Tower Building B uh, would be uh, would comprise 619,000 square feet of floor area, including 68,000 square feet of commercial space and 551,000 square feet of residential space. Office uses are proposed on the second through fourth floors, and Building B would rise to a height of approximately 710 feet. Next slide. As mentioned previously, the development site is comprised of three waterfront blocks located west of River Street between Grand Ferry Park and North Third Street. The site also includes portions of North First Street and Metropolitan Avenue that are proposed to be demapped. Certain portions of the development site, including lands underwater, are owned by the City of New York or the State of New York. The applicant anticipates seeking easements and other such agreements from the city and state as may be necessary to facilitate the proposed development. There is an existing 60 inch combined sewer overflow outfall, which uh, discharges at the terminus of Metropolitan Avenue. The applicant is proposing to relocate the CSO outfall from Metropolitan Avenue to facilitate the proposed development and anticipates coordinating with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection on the design and process as necessary. Next slide. The site design is primarily informed by a combination of flood risk mitigation, the re-envisioning of existing in-water infrastructure and natural habitat restoration, together with active and passive design features. The open space proposal necessitates reconstruction of the existing in water structures, as well as cut and fill and grading strategies to reconfigure and expand the shoreline. Because a large portion of the existing land is being removed or reconfigured to expand the shoreline inland, the bulk of the development is pushed into two mixed use towers with reduced footprints closer to River Street. Portions of Metropolitan Avenue and North First Street are proposed to be demapped to achieve a seamless open space and facilitate a more pedestrian oriented design. Next slide. The proposed development includes a nearly 2.9 acre public open space with approximately 85,000 square feet of waterfront public access area or WPAA and approximately 40,000 square feet of additional public access area or PAA. Next slide. As the Commission may recall, the applicant is proposing a waterfront plan with a breakwater system with the goal of protecting the site from future storm events and facilitating in water activities and natural habitat areas. Next slide. 
key components of the waterfront proposal include the accessible pier-like breakwater structures, an elevated ring that connects the breakwater system to facilitate maximum connectivity over the water, outposts, tidal wetlands to promote ecological benefits, and a cove to facilitate in-water activities, a public beach, and a lawn. Next slide. Next slide, please. This is a view looking down Metropolitan Avenue from River Street. There would be a widened entrance to the open space and a public lawn within the bed of the street proposed to be demapped. The western building frontages along the open space would be designed with publicly accessible arcades. The ring walkway uh, seen here would connect the different programmatic zones in the upland and seaward portions of the site. It would change in elevation and traverse both land and water areas allowing for features such as boat crossings beneath the walkway. Next slide. Here is a rendering and cross section of the proposed beach. The seaward edge of the beach will be designed with an intertidal riprap area and per New York State Department of Health regulations, swimming will be prohibited. Next slide. The open space proposal also includes a salt marsh and tidal pool. Walkways at varying elevations and widths are proposed to provide opportunities for a variety of experiences, including more immersive experiences such as along the lower tidal trail. Next slide. Piers and breakwater structures would include a network of pathways and trails, providing additional access further west on the East River. The three existing caisson structures would be repurposed and designed as outposts with various amenities and program. Next slide. Other active and passive recreation features include a nature play area and a ramped boat launch for non motorized boats, uh, such as kayaks and paddle boards. The lot line edge um, along the Niper plant would be designed with planting and movable seating or an alternate scenario with uh, community kiosks. Next slide. The ground floors of both towers would include active uses along the waterfront and street frontages. As mentioned previously, the western building frontages would have publicly accessible arcades. Building A would include public restroom facilities. The below grade parking garage would be accessed through building B with the entrance from North First Street. Next slide. The proposed towers do not have a distinctive setback and uh, step up incrementally starting at the ground floor level to achieve a graduated setback of approximately three to four feet along River Street. The applicants proposed massing approach that consists of a tower podium blend results in a street wall condition that is experienced as a shear condition without a defined building base or setback zone. This condition differs from standard waterfront bulk regulations that call for setbacks ranging from 10 to 15 feet at a height of 70 feet along street frontages, depending on the street width. Next slide. Next slide, please. Here is a rendering of building A as seen from North 3rd Street and River Street. The tower would gradually step away from the street line the Austin Nichols house is on the right of the image. Uh, and here is a rendering of the proposed towers as seen from the waterfront open space near North 3rd Street. The buildings transition from a triangular footprint to a rectangular tower flow plate, which results in a sloped cantilever along the southwestern frontage of building A and the northwestern frontage of building B. Also seen here are the proposed arcades, which would include entrances to the ground floor uses and be lined with movable seating. Next slide, please. The applicant is requesting a series of land use actions to facilitate the proposed development. The, a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from an M31 district to C62 and M14 districts. Zoning text amendments to establish the development site as an MIH area. Amend the large scale general development uh, special permits ownership requirements and allow reconstructed piers and in water structures that are accessible to the public as part of an LSGD to generate floor area. The applicant is requesting a special permit for a large scale general development 
to modify floor area and bulk regulations and to generate floor area from reconstructed piers and platforms pursuant to the proposed text amendment and a special permit to reduce the parking requirements. The applicant is also seeking zoning authorizations to modify the location, dimension, and design requirements for waterfront public access areas and to permit the phased construction of the WPAA, a landfill action to add approximately 6,300 square feet of land, and a city map change to eliminate, discontinue, close, and dispose of segments of Metropolitan Avenue and North First Street, west of River Street. As well, the applicant is seeking a chairperson certification pursuant to Section 62811 to demonstrate compliance with waterfront regulations as modified by the authorizations. Next slide. The special permit approvals would establish an envelope for the proposed buildings and grant specific modifications to height and setback regulations. The applicant is proposing to modify the maximum base height of 70 feet within the initial setback distance and allow maximum building heights of up to 560 feet for building A and 710 feet for building B. An additional 40 feet for mechanical bulkheads would be permitted. Above a maximum base height of 70 feet, buildings are required to set back 15 feet along narrow streets 10 feet along wide streets and 30 feet along the shore public walkway. The applicant is seeking waivers to allow setbacks that range from a minimum of 3 feet 10 inches along River Street, 4 feet 10 inches along North 3rd Street, and 2 feet 7 inches along North 1st Street. A waiver is also requested for building these cantilever, which would project within the 30 foot initial setback distance from the shore public walkway. The department notes that it still has concerns regarding the sheerness of the towers along River Street and North 3rd Street, which are 50 foot wide narrow streets. The department is continuing to work with the applicant on potential design and massing solutions to mitigate the shear condition and to ensure that the proposed bulk is appropriately shaped to respond to the surrounding narrow street context in the adjacent Austin Nichols building with particular consideration for the pedestrian experience, light and air, and wind mitigation. Additionally, uh, though it does not rise to an environmental impact, a wind study identified high wind speeds at certain locations along the Metropolitan Avenue entrance and arcade. The applicant is looking into design solutions to reduce wind speeds and modify some of the open space design. Next slide. The applicant is proposing a new mechanism through an amendment to the LSGD special permit to allow reconstructed publicly accessible in water structures such as piers and platforms as part of an LSGD to generate floor area, provided that the amount of floor area generated does not exceed the amount that could be generated from existing piers and platforms. The proposed approach is similar to a provision in the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront access plan applicable to the reconstruction of existing or degraded piers and floor area computations. Next slide. The LSGD special permit would allow the transfer of floor area and modify floor area distribution requirements in accordance with the proposed amendment. The proposed uh, the project site includes uh, existing in water structures that meet the definition of existing piers and platforms for the purposes of determining allowable floor area. These structures encompass approximately 19,000 square feet of seaward lot area. Next slide. The applicant is proposing to develop approximately 28,000 square feet of reconstructed publicly accessible in water structures within the seaward lot. Per the proposed text amendment, the applicant is seeking to generate floor area from the reconstructed in water structures capped at 19,000 square feet of existing seaward lot area. This amounts to approximately 140,000 square feet of floor area. Next slide. The applicant is also proposing to eliminate, discontinue, close, and as necessary, dispose of portions of Metropolitan Avenue and a portion of North First Street, west of River Street. The demapping is intended to maximize the area of public open space that will be created and promote a more pedestrian-oriented design. 
The streets proposed to be DNACT have been determined to be under city ownership. These street segments would generate approximately 190,000 square feet of floor area. However, the applicants are not proposing to avail themselves of the floor area derived from the city owned streets, which is typically secured by purchasing the floor area from the city, as they are requesting to generate a similar amount of floor area necessary from the proposed text amendment to facilitate the project. Next slide. This application was certified on August 16th and was duly referred to Brooklyn Community Board 1 and the borough president. Brooklyn Community Board 1 held a public hearing on September 9th and voted to approve the application with conditions on September 14th. 20 in favor, 15 against, and 1 abstention. The Community Board conditions state that the applicant must reduce the total number of apartments by 33% in response to increased loads on infrastructure and services, increase the number of total affordable units to 50%, 60% of affordable units must be two and three bedroom units with family occupancy. All affordable units must have one bedroom with a minimum size of 128 square feet to comfortably accommodate furniture and movement. The applicant must honor prior affordable housing commitments and rent all affordable units at the Domino 1 South 1st Street development. The applicant must provide funding in perpetuity for a local independent organization to oversee and enforce rental fees and increases for affordable and market rate apartments. The applicant must redesign the towers to be more contextual and better connect with the historic fabric of the neighborhood. Next slide. Prior to being granted a rezoning, the applicant must present architectural plans for the proposed YMCA, including the size and location of the proposed facilities. The community facility use must be built out and in operation before the building can be occupied as a rental. The project must use a fossil free energy source, such as a geothermal heat loop system. The applicant must negotiate with the New York City and vicinity District Council of Carpenters to ensure the project adheres to the safest and best construction work practices. The applicant must negotiate with local workforce organizations in order to provide service jobs for local job seekers. The applicant and the City of New York must present and execute a plan to manage the increasing volume of street trash. And lastly, the City of New York must include funding for the full completion of Bushwick Inlet Park in the 10-year capital plan. Next slide. The borough president sent a letter on September 15th to waive their formal comment period. The public hearing was held on September 27th and the borough president's recommendations are forthcoming. Next slide. A draft environmental impact statement was prepared pursuant to the requirements of SEEKER. The DEIS determined that the project would have significant adverse impacts in the categories of transportation, pedestrians and street user safety, and construction noise. Waterfront revitalization program consistency review was also completed and the project was determined to be consistent with WRP policies. That uh, concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Amrita. Uh, questions from the commission? Commissioner Rampershad. Uh, yes, actually, I have two questions. Uh, on Wednesday, if the applicant team can speak to how they're going to address the concerns raised by the community board. And also during certification, I have brought this up with regards to the 60 inch combined sewer. Uh, I know they said they would, uh, I guess, reach out to DEP. I'm just wondering since that time, have they had any discussions or any written commitment from DEP? to work with them to discontinue that 60 inch combined sewer on Metropolitan oh, Avenue. Sure, so we have relayed that uh, comment to the applicant and they can speak to their efforts so far with DEP and any uh, recent updates based on those conversations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bernie. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks Amrita for a really good, clear presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, and this is maybe my lack of experience, but it seems to me, I mean, I know, you know, the sort of alchemy of creating development rights out of nothing seems to be reaching a new level by taking the river 
and deciding that it's FAR. Is this something that we condone and has happened frequently? That's sort of my first question. Um, so the proposed mechanism is actually something that is available within the Greenpoint Williamsburg Waterfront Access Plan area, which is just one block north of the project site. Um, in that zone, um, there are certain uh, criteria established for existing piers and platforms. So existing piers and platforms are anything that is uh, visible in the 1988 aerial photographs of New York City. And if um, the peers, whether they're existing or degraded, meet that criteria, um, mm -hmm. it is possible to generate floor area uh, from that portion of the seaward zoning lot but it's capped at 20% of uh, the seaward lot area. And the proposed approach is very much uh, akin to what we have within the Greenpoint Williamsburg lab. So that, that only applies in the, Greens, in the Greenpoint Williamsburg plan? That's doesn't correct. apply in other parts of the city? That's correct. So this so, site is outside of that uh, geography. So why did it find its way into the Greens, Greenpoint Williamsburg plan, I wonder? Um, I, don't uh, have that background, but I can certainly um, follow up on um, yeah. the thinking back then and get back to you. Uh, at it, it just it just seems a strange gift to suddenly decide that a bunch of collapsed piers are worth 140,000 square feet of development rights. It seems like a, <laughs> an extraordinary contribution to the real estate industry that we've made with this. We can follow up on that background. Yeah. Anyway, it's more of a comment than a question. Sure. Uh, and the other question was, you know, just following up on Commissioner Rampashan's uh, question there, they're going to move the CSO outlet. What are they doing within the development to not add to the problem in terms of um, reduction, in terms of retention and detention? I'd be interested to know because this is a huge amount of additional uh, sewage that they're generating, and it, obviously stormwater control would be a concern also. That's right. Uh, we can relay that comment to the applicant um, and they can speak more to um, how they plan to manage stormwater runoff in the site. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any additional questions from the commission on this? Okay, if not, this will be ready for public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you very much, Amrita. Thank you. The 10th item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a citywide zoning text amendment. Our presenter uh, is Ben Huff. I want to note that Commissioner Cirillo is recused on this item. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I'm excited to present today on the Open Restaurants text amendment. I'm joined by Carolyn Grossman-Marr, Eric Gregory, and Crystal Exke for the DCP project team and our colleagues, Julie Shipper of DOT, who will present some updates later in the presentation, and Karin Sommer, also of DOT, who will join during Q&A. Uh, before we discuss the specifics of the zoning proposal, I wanna quickly recap some of the high-level details of the overall permanent program um, that DOT Commissioner Gutman presented back in June. So in March, 2020, the existing Department of Consumer Workforce Protection Sidewalk Cafe program had 1,224 cafes actively licensed citywide, mostly unenclosed, and the vast majority located in Manhattan. DOT ran a small pilot of 25 Manhattan-based street seats. Uh, these programs were relatively expensive and hard to access, resulting in the smaller number of them and the concentration in expensive commercial districts of the city. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to provide support for the hospitality industry and the need to move dining outdoors, New York City stood up the open restaurants program that allowed for the emergency use of sidewalks and roadways by restaurants. This was achieved by suspending zoning uh, and rules through executive order that allowed restaurants to conduct outdoor dining in the public right away. To date, over 11 and a half thousand restaurants have participated in the open restaurants program in particular, the city saw a huge surge of outdoor dining occur in the outer boroughs, and 10,000 of the restaurants have used the sidewalk for their outdoor dining setup. The city estimates that 100,000 jobs were saved in the restaurant industry that could have been lost had the city not allowed the move of dining outdoors. Um, this program by the city was able to not just save restaurants, but also create a sea of change in the potential of our streets and street life. 
Since the launch of the program in June of 2020, we've learned both positive and negative lessons, and those lessons are critical to informing how we proceed with a permanent program. On the positive side, we think the robust use of the emergency program was helped by three things. First, unlike the pre-emergency sidewalk cafe program, no geographies were off limits. Any restaurant with ground floor frontage and sidewalk or roadway space that met the criteria could participate. Second, the program was free and easy to access, unlike the pre-COVID sidewalk cafe program, which required months of multiple reviews by multiple agencies. And third, the element of roadway dining gave restaurants brand new options, um, particularly those that might not have enough room on the sidewalk to accommodate a cafe. I would also like to note some of the challenges the city has seen. First, the speed of the rollout and the fact that the program was built from scratch under emergency circumstances created some confusion. As DOT learned more about an operating a program like this and the program was extended by the mayor into the winter, some of the guidance had to change along the way to keep everyone safe. Second, throughout the program, DOT learned more about the challenge specific to the roadway seating and its interaction with the roadway. For instance, we've heard from other agencies such as FDNY and the MTA that there were issues with turning radius and safety signs being blocked. And third, enforcement has been complicated on multiple fronts. On one hand, you have restaurants who are dealing with a lot, feeling squeezed and over over-inspected by too many agencies. On the other hand, you had communities, particularly the mobility impaired, who are concerned about under-enforcement and requiring that restaurants respond to their concerns. At a high level, the Permanent Open Restaurants pro Program will be run by the Department of Transportation to make available to restaurants the option of sidewalk and roadway seating for outdoor dining. This program will look to balance the many needs of the street and sidewalk keeping restaurants and other users in mind. Finally, this program will take what has worked and what has not worked in the past uh, when developing the permanent future guidelines. We anticipate that like in the emergency, um, uh, the future program will be available citywide to any restaurant with ground floor frontage and a DOHMH or Department of Health active license. Um, both the sidewalk and roadway cafes will be required to be removable and will be subject to clear path and other siting criteria, which we'll go over those proposed rules later. And exact design requirements will be figured out in a design engagement process and rulemaking. In the next few slides, I'll talk in more detail, but it's important to underscore that we think the most successful versions of cafes are those that activate but don't privatize the street environment and that allow for street access for other users like street work when needed. For sidewalk cafes, we anticipate that participating restaurants will have year round access to their business frontage for sidewalk cafe seating. The city will publish specific guidelines that will be very clear for restaurants to understand. And we think this is the best way to balance the various uses of the sidewalk um, to maximize feelings of openness as well as activity to the general public. Most importantly, the size and scale of the cafes is defined by the size of the sidewalk, a requirement for a clear path and other obstructions on it that are, and that all cafes be ADA compliant. Part of the design guidelines will be responding to the multitudes of street furniture that share the sidewalk. The rules for specific distances are being sourced in part from pre-existing DCWP program and will include distance from life and safety infrastructure like hydrants and other obstructions like city bike stations, again, which we'll discuss later. The introduction of the roadway option uh, is, has been that tremendous new opportunity for restaurants. Um, we think the new program uh, should propose that it be allowed as they are now in all areas of the city, except where loading bus lanes and other street rules preclude. As with the sidewalk cafes, it's important that they are removable to allow for storage when street work needs to occur. And it's important that they remain unenclosed to allow for lines of sight between all street users, um, pedestrians, between cars and pedestrians, and so that cars can see signs and so on. The city is working to define what kinds of shading and screening can still be allowed and meet that goal of removability and plan to release a visual guidebook that provides specific refer references for restaurants and the general public. We want to support flexibility and creativity while ensuring safety first. 
Both programs will be, as the sidewalk program already is, subject to sound rules, including prohibitions on amplified sound and hours of operation. To make this program a reality, there's three steps that need to advance, each through a somewhat different process. The first is the removal of location, locational prohibitions through a citywide zoning text amendment, allowing restaurants to apply as long as they meet the sidewalk requirements and helping streamline agency review. Second, the team is working with city council to enact legislation which will move the sidewalk cafe program from DCWP to the Department of Trans Transportation while also updating the admin code rules for how sidewalk cafes will work. Third, the city will create the inaugural set of laws and design guidelines for roadway cafes. We are working towards a completed legal process and the launch of the new application process in late 2022 or early 2023. The current emergency program is expected to be in effect until the launch of the permit program. We expect that restaurants will have ample time to transition into the new program and communities will continue to have opportunities to provide input and guidance on making this program work for them as well. So to get back to the proposal before the commission today, the proposed text amendment would remove the entirety of Article 1, Chapter 4 of the zoning resolution and related text in special districts and other areas that relate to sidewalk cafes to fully remove zoning from dictating the location of cafes. This will allow any restaurant to apply to DOT for a sidewalk cafe if they can meet the required clear path and setting criteria. Unnecessary zoning restrictions stand in the way of thousands of restaurants from participating in outdoor dining past the emergency. This zoning proposal is key to unlocking the full citywide applicability and again, consolidating control and accountability for the future program under the Department of Transportation. Under the zoning rules, um, zoning dictates three different kinds of cafes and where in the city they can be located. Most common are unenclosed cafes, which allow for readily removable tables, chairs, and fencing with no allowable overhead coverage other than umbrellas or retractable roofs. Second, small sidewalk cafes are unenclosed sidewalk cafes containing no more than a single row of tables and chairs adjacent to the street line and can extend no farther than four and a half feet from the building. The third are enclosed cafes, which are defined as extensions of the building into the sidewalk using light building materials and requiring 50% transparency on its walls. Zoning held the geographic restrictions of where these cafe types were allowed. The regulations are visible in the city planning Zola map application, and we have created this map here to demonstrate how that zoning worked. So in yellow are areas where only small cafe types were allowed. Purple are areas where only unenclosed or small cafe types are allowed. And green is where all cafe types are allowed. Importantly, you can see a lot of areas where cafes are not allowed at all even if the sidewalks are wide and conditions otherwise would have allowed it. So red are areas specifically prohibited from having cafes in the zoning resolution and blue is all the residential areas of the city. So during the emergency program of the 11,000, 11 and open restaurants um, using sidewalks, uh, two and a half thousand restaurants are permitted in areas that would have been prohibited or limited under existing zoning. The proposed text amendment will allow them as long as they meet the requirements outlined by DOT. So looking at the map on the right, in red are restaurants in specific areas that were prohibited by zoning. So these include commercial mid blocks, certain special districts on streets that contain elevated rail lines and other named congested areas. And again, in blue are the non-conforming restaurants in residential areas. There are many reasons why these areas were prohibited, but what we've seen during COVID-19 and the emergency order is that cafes can work in many more locations than zoning contemplated. Here you can see photos of sidewalk cafes operating in the emergency program in special districts, on streets with elevated rail lines, um, in central business districts, and we have a restaurant on the bottom right that is a non-conforming restaurant in a residential area. Zoning does not allow restaurants in residential areas, but many of these restaurants uh, predate the zoning that are in those areas and have remained. Uh, we estimate there's about 
2,900 restaurants citywide in March of 2020, and 1,000 participated in the open restaurants program. We think what's more important is that the sidewalk condition and having enough room for pedestrians. And those are siting criteria, not neighborhood criteria. So we really think that zoning is not working and that physical rules would work far better. Other cleanup actions in the text amendment include removing definitions and cross-references to cafes, removing text that precludes operable windows that service outdoor restaurants, ensuring that no enclosure provisions require a restaurant to be fully indoors as a condition of its zoning district, and clarifying that sidewalk widening text does not conflict with participation in the open restaurants program. As a result of referring the text on June 21st, we had a 90 day referral period to accommodate the summer breaks in August and now have completed an extensive outreach process. We've presented to well over, uh, we, we've presented well over a hundred times um, and uh, to many boards, many both to the um, sort of land use committee or transportation committee, as well as the full, board, uh, full boards and 40, five boards have voted. Uh, we have presented to four borough boards um, and one borough board has voted as of today. Um, so we've had 20 boards vote favorably or favorably with conditions and 23 unfavorably or unfavorably with conditions and um, two have waived um, or had no objection. There are a lot of comments from a lot of different boards and we have bucketed them into eight categories that we will go through in detail. It's, to safe, it's safe to say that almost all boards had these eight concerns and there are a few boards that had specific comments and we will try to highlight those um, in the next part of the presentation. So in general, many boards express support for helping restaurants and understand that open restaurants were necessary to helping them survive during the restrictive heights of the COVID-19 pandemic, but they were worried about the effects the broad permanent changes to the public realm um, might have on resident quality of life and the ability for the general public to enjoy public space. Concerns which though in many cases are not germane to the specifics of the text amendment really are critical to the success of the overall program. So we are going to take the unusual step of talking about some of the larger overarching issues first, and then returning to the much more modest technical zoning comments at the end. So for this next section, I'll be joined by um, DCP and DOT design colleagues. So turning to category one, design, Many communities are concerned about the physical rules that restaurants will have to obey and how they interact with other users. Some of the concerns are specific rule concerns like ensuring roadway setups can interact with drivers safely, that sanitation pickup and roadway setups do not conflict, or that setups in historic districts fit their context. Others are more general concerns about ugliness, especially based on the lax rules and limited enforcement for large, often non-compliant, physically imposing structures, sometimes full buildings that have proliferated. While concerns have primarily been focused on roadway setups, the concerns have been somewhat universal and mixed with concerns about enforcement. However, from a rules perspective, it is important to distinguish a sidewalk cafe, which have a well-established set of design criteria and rules already in law, and roadway, which are new and have only had emergency rules. So to talk a little bit about the design rules and process, we're gonna turn it over to Eric Gregory, DCP's chief urban designer, and Julie Shipper, deputy chief of staff for DOT to discuss. Thanks, Ben. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Eric Gregory. I'll be speaking primarily on the proposed rules for the sidewalk seating, and then I'll hand it off to our DOT colleague, Julie Shipper, who will share updates on the roadway seating and what the forthcoming engagement on design process uh, will look like that will inform future rulemaking. Next slide. Many of the sidewalk elements uh, we interact with each day are overseen by the Department of Transportation. Their street design manual provides siting guidelines for bus shelters, street lamps, traffic signals, newsstands, and many other components. Balancing the needs of a variety of uses and functions on our sidewalks is key to ensure that they are safe, accessible, and accommodate pedestrian flows while, while remaining vibrant and lively. Next slide. 
It's important to mention uh, briefly how the arrangement of various elements or zones work uh, across the sidewalk uh, from the building frontage to the curb line. As we walk through the siting criteria, each of these areas plays an important role. The seating and service area adjacent to the restaurant or building frontage as seen at the right uh, is then followed uh, by the uh, clear path, um, which allows for the, the free flowing and accessible movement of pedestrians. Uh, within that, uh, the amenity zone runs adjacent to and parallel with the curb, where we find trees, street trees, traffic lights, and other furniture. And finally, the curb line where the roadway seating happens. Next slide. While most focus, um, while most of the focus publicly has been on the roadway seating, there's been a wide variety of setups on our sidewalks, some resembling what we saw before the emergency order and many going beyond what was previously seen or allowed under the sidewalk cafe program administered by DCWP. These range from seating in the amenity zone to shade structures bolted into the sidewalk to full on enclosures. Next slide. As Ben mentioned earlier, the existing sidewalk rules, sidewalk cafe program administered by the Department of Consumer and Workforce Protection or DCWP has rules and guidance in place that dictate how a cafe be decided. We want to replicate the look and feel, removable tables and chairs, barriers and planters of what we saw on our sidewalks before the emergency order and what we will see established in a new permanent open restaurant program run by the Department of Transportation. As we go through the design criteria, we'll, be with the, we'll begin with the siting criteria rules that will not change, followed by those that will be adjusted and closed with addition, additions that bring the program in alignment with the, the sidewalk design manual and what we have learned from the emergency open restaurants. Next slide. From our perspective, we need to start from the premise of a return to ensuring sidewalks remain free and clear and open of permanent obstructions. This is also the case under the emergency rules, but we understand that there has been confusion on this critical point and has led to some problematic structures on our sidewalks, like you see here on the right. To reconfirm, while we are looking to make a program that includes as many potential restaurant setups in the future as possible, that does not mean that structures like this or any structures permanently affixed to the sidewalk can remain in perpetuity. Many restaurants will likely need to modify their setups to come back into compliance. Next slide. As shared earlier, the, the, the previously stated amenity zone is where a vast majority of sidewalk furniture, such as bike racks, bus stops, and other items are located. Um, during the emergency program, many sidewalk setups use the amenity zone for additional seating, whether it is an extension of the roadway setup or those setups on the sidewalk. This will not be allowed uh, as we move into the permanent program. Next slide. Several of the siting rules or coordinated distances from sidewalk furniture and elements will, will carry over and remain unchanged. Here are some, some visual examples of elements whose dimensional clearance is defined by the sidewalk cafe program will not change. So this includes um, perimeter fencing, um, distances to fire hydrants or parking meters, exhaust ducts, um, and also uh, guide, guidelines for umbrellas um, and retractable awnings. Next slide. So this list is kind of uh, just gives you more of the actual dimensions um, of, of some of those items. So you'll notice that um, there's going forward, you know, all sidewalk setups will have to be level with the sidewalk. So again, no platforms, they must be, uh, we must ensure ADA accessibility. Um, there's a, a host of uh, dimensions uh, under, the, under the current DCPW, DCWP programs for building edge uh, and distances from uh, uh, primary entrances. Uh, and also not to um, not to block certain uh, aspects, as well as uh, the setups themselves. So the the perimeter fence height, for instance, must remain at, at two and a half feet in height. Next slide. So uh, unlike the majority of sidewalk rules, uh, so while the majority of sidewalk rules will remain unchanged, that that is revert to what was already under the DCWP rules. The city team has identified a few places where the rules would rules changes would make sense and that have arisen since we have seen new issues crop up under the temporary rules. And, and as we have thoroughly reviewed the DCWP rules, which had not been updated in some time. Next slide. Perhaps the most critical dimension is the clear path. Under the existing rule, which has geographical lim limitations overall, um, the sidewalks greater than 16 feet or uh, must have 50% of the sidewalk width clear. 
sidewalks less than 16 feet must have an eight foot clearance. Um, there, it's worth noting that there was a prohibition on sidewalks uh, with less than 12 feet. The open restaurants rule um, did away with uh, all of that and just said eight feet uh, everywhere was the rule. Um, so when we think about the proposed rule for the permanent open restaurants, we'll reflect that, that of the, it will reflect that of the DCWP program with adjustments to account for high pedestrian traffic areas and select central business districts um, corridors that were previously prohibited or limited by small designations. This is also balanced against not making the rules too restrictive in too many locations, as we know that, that even eight feet when strictly enforced may be difficult for many restaurants on narrow sidewalks uh, to adhere to. Um, we, we do know that there's many open restaurants that are on sidewalks uh, of less than 11 feet. So every foot will make a huge difference here. Uh, but we think this proposal strikes the right balance of inclusion and protection for pedestrians. So um, as you can see in the, the map on the left, those areas that are highlighted in blue are these uh, corridors within higher traffic central district business district type areas, uh, which will uh, have the 12 foot um, clear path requirement. All of the areas which are highlighted in gray and um, uh, by nature not, you can tell here because there's a lot of them uh, will be eight feet throughout the city. Next slide. So this is just a, a graphic representation uh, that kind of walks through this in a little bit more detail. Um, so again, uh, working from left to right, um, there'll be instances where sidewalks from a range from 11 to uh, 15 feet. Um, again, you'll have to have eight feet or 50% clear. So what's depicted here is if we uh, did a small sidewalk cafe of just a couple tables and chairs, um, moving to the center image, uh, this is what would kind of be shown for a sidewalk uh, in the areas that was highlighted blue. So it would have been a, a central business district or high traffic area. Um, you would need to provide um, 12 feet um, uh, clearance of clear path or 50% if it, it was greater than uh, 15 feet. And then finally, just another depiction of a 15 foot wide sidewalk where um, we would see you know, a, a larger sidewalk cafe, which still allows for about seven feet in this case, uh, while uh, providing the eight foot of clearance. Next slide. In limited instances within residential areas, many side street restaurants are not able to access the roadway seating due to conflicts with bike lanes, hydrants, or no standing zones. These low foot track areas, to, low foot traffic areas, tend to tend to have variations in sidewalk width at corners or narrow. Uh, or narrow, and there are a number of restaurants that fall within this band. Providing a waiver process would ensure that these businesses could still access the program while also ensuring safe, ac accessible navigation of the sidewalk. Proposed waiver application criteria listed here has been developed with the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities to ensure that minimum clear path requirements are maintained and enforced. Um, so the proposed rule here um, would uh, would be again for primary residential and local commercial areas, which may submit the request um, to reduce the clear path from eight feet to no less than six feet. Um, this will be a case by case basis, uh, working in concert with DOT and the Mayor's Office for Persons with Disability. Um, and uh, the example shown here is uh, kind of a neighborhood level restaurant where there's a pinch point at a traffic sign. Uh, of, of six feet. So this would allow uh, their setup to continue uh, in this case if they were to apply uh, and get granted a waiver. Next slide. Um, another area of focus is the service aisle. So um, this is a, another novel issue that's arisen from CUNY board feedback uh, is rules around the service aisle. In the DCPW, DCWP program, a three foot aisle is required regardless of cafe size. Um, as required, uh, regardless of cafe size, open restaurants has not published rules on a service aisles, which on one hand has con contributed to more limited, limited service use and more single table setups on narrow streets, but also to significant uses of clear path for servicing, which is a challenge, particularly in high traffic areas. Next slide. Um, another area is corner lot lines. So this would accommodate pedestrian overflow at the intersection by freeing up the corner of the building from any obstruction. So uh, the existing rule, uh, sidewalks must be nine feet from the point on a corner lot. Uh, open restaurants rule, corner conditions didn't clearly specify, but seating may not exceed the business frontage. Um, and so going forward, 
um, we're proposing all seating must uh, must be contained within the building frontage and, and at least nine feet from the point on a corner lap. Next slide. Uh, for city bikes, there was no prior rule for the existing or for the previous program, which can now be addressed. Uh, city, city bikes on sidewalks is not widely spread throughout the city. Uh, so this is a unique instance, uh, a specific clearance will be necessary to maintain uh, sidewalk accessibility and safety. Um, so uh, again, no rule in the existing uh, program, uh, the open restaurants uh, emergency rule was a, was a no may not block. And here we're, we're providing a 10 foot clearance. Next slide. So here's a, a grouping of a few uh, elements um, listed here that, that had differing dimensional clearances with that of the uh, of DOT sidewalk design manual. Um, and so here the proposed rule will bring these into an alignment. Um, and these clearances shown reflect the proposed clearances um, uh, that, we'll, that we'll see moving forward. Next slide. And lastly, uh, for sidewalks, uh, some sidewalk elements, sidewalk elements within the existing DCWP program had specific dimensional clearances that during the emergency order were simplified and tied to the clear path, like traffic signals, street lights, and tree pits, or they were to not block uh, along building frontages, frontages like freight and service entries or other ground floor entries such as retail. So these are um, all, all things that we're looking to clean up and simplify as we move forward into the permanent program. And with that, I'll pass it on to Julie. Thanks, Eric. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and thank you to the commission for having us here today. As Eric discussed, while sidewalk cafes have a much longer tradition in this city, and thus a clearer set of legacy design rules to rely upon, a range of novel issues are raised by roadway setups um, are a new vernacular in our street design and necessitate thoughtful consideration as we build a permanent design framework and rules. So the approach we are taking is to step back and define the principles for the final rules from which we begin the engagement process for putting forward the final guidelines, rule packages, and instruction manuals that will guide the program. Next slide, please. As the rules for the permanent program are being developed, DOT and DCP have spent the last few months presenting updates on the program to the community boards. The two agencies have been given a lot of feedback through these meetings and have taken deep look into what has been successful in the emergency program and what has not been as successful. Through this process, we have come up with a number of principles we will take into account in our design process. I will go into, in, deeper into these principles in the coming slides. Next slide, please. So first on safety, safety is of course of utmost importance here and critical to making the program successful. In order to ensure the safety of the structures, clear guidance will be given on the height, width, and weight requirements of the barriers. As this guidance is developed, we understand we need to be mindful that the barriers may need to be moved and stored and the desire for creativity. We will touch on this more throughout the presentation, particularly when we talk about the design process. Next slide, please. Accessibility. It is of it is important to make sure that these set, setups are truly accessible and made available for all New Yorkers and users of the program. Throughout the emergency program, we have heard about mixed experiences with structures that use ramps and structures that have had flush grades with the sidewalk. For the final program, we'll be looking closely at platform and ramp requirements and working closely with the mayor's office for people with disabilities to ensure seamless openness while also allowing for removability and cleaning and looking particularly to maximize openness along the curb line of the setups. Next slide, please. Sight lines. Another aspect of safety that needs to be addressed in the rules for the final program is sight lines. We need to ensure a balance between the amount of setup that may be conflicting with other things like seeing sights, turn, drivers turning, um, while making sure vertical elements and structures are not blocking safety signage. You can see here the structure is potentially conflicting with a tree and blocking our safety regulation signs, which is a challenge. We will also be looking at those aerial relationships between roadway and buildings that potentially have safety or privatizing effects. Next slide, please. DOT and DCP have been working closely with FDNY and NYPD to make sure this program meets all of their safety requirements. The width of setups on narrow streets is creating a particular challenge for emergency vehicles to access both streets and when turning. 
We will be looking at potential adjustments to max depths of the setups in certain conditions and in setting back further from intersections where needed to facilitate appropriate emergency access. Next slide. So thinking about seasonality and inclement winter weather, the city is proposing that the new program will not operate during colder months, but with some opportunity for a hardship waiver that would allow restaurants to keep their setups in place. The seasonality of the roadway program would allow for other city operational needs to continue, such as snow cleanup and construction. For now, all restaurants will be able to keep operating uninterrupted through this upcoming winter season through our emergency program. Next slide. It is pretty remarkable how much we have going on on our streets. Bike lanes, bus lanes, loading zones, construction, and now restaurants. One of the main principles we will need to consider throughout our design process is the interaction and balancing the use of space between all of these different priorities. Next slide. I'm now going to switch gears to talk about our upcoming design process in order to develop the guidelines and inform rulemaking for this program. Next. We know this program will be most successful when receiving feedback from all of our different partners. So the first step of engagement here will be to set up an interagency task force with representatives from a number of diff different city agencies, which you can see here. DOT and DCP in partnership with RPA, Design Trust, and Tri-State Transportation Campaign will plan to host a series of in-person and remote roundtable events throughout the fall and winter. These discussions will offer opportunities for New Yorkers to share their thoughts on the Open Restaurants program and give input into the final rules, which will balance creativity, feasibility, and cost as they seek to ensure comfort and safety for all New Yorkers and users of this program. Next slide. Following our engagement process, draft design guidelines will be released. This will be followed with a robust community and borough level engagement process to gain as much feedback as possible in advance of the, CAPA, the full CAPA rulemaking process. Following the adoption of the CAPA rules, DOT will publish final design rules and an easy to use application. I encourage you all to visit our website, nyc.gov slash open restaurants for more updated information. I'll now turn it back over to Ben to continue talking about um, the next steps in this process. So thanks, Eric and Julie, for all that information. So in addition to concerns on design, uh, communities also express concerns about current operational challenges continuing into the permanent program. A major concern for a lot, a lot of community boards expressed was cleanliness and vermin population. On this, the city team has been working with the Department of Health, which has issued specific guidance to restaurants on maintaining cleanliness in their outdoor setups and is continuing to look at whether additional design rules can assist. In particular, Department of Health has cited the need for cleaning under roadway platforms, which is yet another reason why removability of set up, uh, setups will be key in the permanent program. Communities are also concerned about hours of operation, which while they are limited now and would be under the permanent program are abused as is the noise policy. Communities have expressed concern about trash pickup being more frequent and feeling that outdoor cafes were contributing to the uncleanliness of streets generally. And finally, residents are concerned about the overall number of restaurants participating and if it makes sense to cap the amount on a particular block. Although we don't anticipate capping the number of restaurants per block, per block um, DOT does plan to review areas of clusters of outdoor dining to ensure it does not impact safety or access to the street. So many of these issues come down to the overarching concern for adequate enforcement. To accomplish this program, DOT will be hiring additional staff to create a dedicated open restaurants team. This will include hiring additional inspectors that will have support from borough offices to coordinate and address the needs of specific neighborhoods. The focus of this team will be compliance of setups and adherence to the design guidelines. NYPD will continue to primarily respond to late night noise issues or criminal behavior. The Department of Sanitation um, will continue to you know, service trash pickups and can enforce any infractions on the failure of restaurants to properly dispose waste. Um, and Department of Health has been expanding their letter grade inspections to include outdoor dining setups and to ensure that these outdoor setups are safe for dining. 
So in the new program, the agencies will work together so infractions at all these levels can be referred back to the Department of Transportation's open restaurants team. So for instance, if a restaurant routinely being identified by Department of Health as keeping its outdoors unclean, uh, that information will be referred back to DOT to be aware and consider revocation of a license. Similarly, if NYPD finds a restaurant routinely being an issued uh, a issues uh, for after hours, DOT will be receiving that information and will be up to them to work those infractions into its review process, as well as with the Office of Nightlife that will play a role, a support role in mediation. Overall, the goal is to set up a new team with the technology, information, and capacity to well-regulate a program that is now and will likely continue to be of considerable size. Okay, so switching to another issue, there was a lot of concern at community boards that the city has created a windfall of benefits for restaurants and not other retail uses. The concern is by allowing only restaurants the use of public space, other retail uses will suffer and shift the balance of streets to favor restaurant use. We should just, you know, stepping back a second from that argument, um, overall business at New York City restaurants have not reached pre-pandemic level and may not for some time. DCP has done some analysis, MasterCard credit card data, which indicates transactions and spending volume at restaurants in the NYC area. Although this research is preliminary, we see that spending at restaurants is roughly 70% of what they were pre-pandemic levels. We think this is partly from business just shifting from indoors to outdoors due to some aversions or continued restrictions on indoor dining and the overall reduction of visitors and tourists to the city. Um, as far as an effect on retail diversity, there are two facts that we are mindful of. First, there is much evidence that restaurants benefit commercial corridors and retail as they bring in additional foot traffic. Second, that while we hope for a robust use of the future program, there are a number of reasons to believe that the current emergency usage is a high watermark of outdoor dining. Namely, the current program is free, has minimal process and liberal rules and enforcement and a strong necessity for use because of restrictions on indoor dining. DCP has taken a look at sidewalk width citywide and we think we particularly think that enforcement of the clear path will be hard to meet when restaurants have to document um, that they can maintain the clear path requirement. In the future, there will almost certainly be more cafes than there were pre COVID, but we are assuming that there will be less cafes than exist in the emergency program. We also understand that New York City retail mix has been affected by many different factors prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is a graph from uh, City Planning's 2017 resale study. The effects of e-commerce has had a negative effect on dry goods retail for some time and is likely to continue irrespective to the addition of outdoor dining. While we understand the concern of community members that want other uses to benefit from public space, that is not covered in this text amendment, which is specifically focused on sidewalk cafe regulations. Another particular concern of some communities is the ability for non-conforming restaurants and residential districts to now be able to apply to the sidewalk cafe program. The concern is not so much that about the restaurants and residential districts that already exist, but rather the potential for large scale conversion of non-conforming commercial space in residential districts into restaurants. This is particularly a concern in neighborhoods where there is a large amount of non-conforming commercial space. And we can see that here in Manhattan Community Boards 2, 3, and Brooklyn Community Board 1. In response to this, the project team has spoken with commercial real estate brokers who specialize in restaurant leases. We understand from these conversations that converting a non-restaurant space to a restaurant space is very costly. Taking a raw retail space will require gas hookups, um, additional bathrooms, and full build outs of restaurants that require a lot of upfront cap uh, capital, making conversion unlikely. Second, outdoor dining does not, guarantee, uh, does not promise guaranteed business for restaurant as it is dependent on many things, chiefly weather. In this case, Berger said it is difficult to factor outdoor dining into the base lease costs and instead charges as a percentage of profit rather than an additional overall cost for the space. 
So outdoor dining areas are challenging to maintain uh, spaces. They're challenging spaces to maintain. And we mentioned before the city will be charging a fee for the use of this space. So for these reasons, we feel allowing restaurants to have outdoor dining will not be a major um, factor in shifting non-conforming commercial spaces to mostly restaurants. Many, if not all community boards were concerned about their level of input in the process and oversight. They are also concerned they won't be part of the Roadway Cafe program and overall confusion on exactly how the future application process will work. There's been widespread misinterpretation that community boards will be removed from the sidewalk cafe process, and that is not the case. Although community boards have not been involved in the emergency program, we expect in the permanent program, community boards will have the same power over sidewalk cafes as mandated by the city charter and as was required in the DCWP program. The application process has not been done in a year and a half, and many of these community boards have sort of forgotten how it worked, but we felt the overall process did work and we are adopting most of what of that for the sidewalk cafe portion of the permanent open restaurants program. Restaurants will have to apply, go through community review, be given a license, and we'll have to renew. Um, the enforcement process that we discussed earlier, that will be occurring the entire time the restaurants are operating the outdoor space. Our understanding of the charter is that roadway rules will have to come to the public for input through a community process, but we do not expect that the public will review each roadway cafe. So a few technical zoning issues have arisen in community and borough board comments. So first on sidewalk widening, we've heard the concern that amendments to 3305 and 4303, which would make it clear that sidewalk widening provisions don't preclude participation in open restaurants, should not be allowed because widenings not, uh, widening should not be allowed to be recouped for private use again. This was a particular concern in Manhattan Community Board 4. We don't think that it makes sense to consider how a sidewalk was built as part of the consideration for participation in the program. We think the setting criteria should apply to the lay understanding of a sidewalk from building to curb line, regardless of ownership condition. Requiring otherwise could produce a number of perverse outcomes. For instance, pushing a cafe outboard of a building line to avoid the widened portion or creating a large clear path requirement or even excluding a restaurant from participation because it's in a building with widening, even if it's next door neighbor with less sidewalk width is not subject to the same exclusion. What we do think makes sense is to address the need for more clearance in high traffic areas, especially those areas which will be new to the program or pre previously limited to the small cafe designation. Uh, that is why the 12 foot requirement makes sense in, in those cases. This is also why the continuance of the 50% clear path rule makes sense because in a case where a sidewalk widening, either required or voluntary, results in a sidewalk that is wider than 16 feet or 24 feet in a high traffic zone, the 50% requirement makes sure that a large portion of the wide sidewalks is set aside. So for instance, if I, you know, if the, I was 11 feet, but my widening required me to set back to create a 20 foot sidewalk, my clear path requirement will be 10 feet and not eight feet. Second, in a few locations such as C1 and C5 districts and non-conforming commercial uses in our districts, we've modified the text to ensure that, that eating and drinking establishments do not need to be fully enclosed building, particularly to allow for indoor-outdoor integration. We've heard on one end of the spectrum concern that allowing facades to be opened up is an effect and encouragement to do so, which may create more noise challenges as well as energy and efficiency. On the other hand, we've heard comments that we should have gone further and made all uses eligible for facade flexibility. Idea being that treating some uses different in some districts is really an anachronism and somewhat arbitrary. In terms of the first concern, we note that noise codes and energy codes will still apply and that being allowed under zoning has not been sufficient in any case for violations of those two codes. And to the idea of liberalizing for other uses, it's an interesting point. This text was focused on enabling outdoor dining and it would be out of scope to address other uses at this point, but it will be interesting to hear if this is presenting a challenge to other commercial uses. Finally, 
Uh, last but not least, it was noted that in changing the enclosure provisions, we have removed the word seated dining in one area, leading one community board to be concerned that we are removing critical constraint on more club-like eating and drinking establishments. While we believe in practice that this clause was not relevant to the enforcement on seated patrons in cafes, we do believe that the, the reestablishment of clear site plan review process for cafes, which will require the documentation of tables and chairs, will be a check against more densely packed seating area. So our final uh, issue that we wanna cover is that we've heard from community boards, why don't we move faster to the permanent program? Why does the temporary program have to last so long? Conversely, some community boards have had a concern that they had to vote on a text amendment before the sidewalk and roadway cafe rules are decided. These community boards have a desire to see the new rules in action and see if they work to improve the issues they have documented and have a sunset clause if they do not. In this sense, we've been criticized as moving both too fast and too slow. DOT and DCP are following the process for ULERP for this text amendment, as well as for the CAPA rulemaking for the rest of the permanent program. We also need to be considerate of the effect that rule changes, enforcement, and a new program launch will have on restaurants currently using the emergency program and want to provide them enough time to transition to the permanent program if they choose to do so. At the same time, many restaurants are in a lurch and stand to lose the ability to apply to the permanent program if we, do not, if we do not make these zoning changes. It is important that we give them the comfort that the permanent program is moving forward. So while we are sympathetic to the idea of having perfect information now, and that would be nice, we think it's really important to take the time to get the sidewalk and cafe, uh, sidewalk and roadway rules right, but it should not stop us with moving forward with this zoning proposal component. So with that, on behalf of the project team, I'd like to say thank you for hearing our proposal and the project, myself and the project team are ready for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ben, Eric, and Julie for that very comprehensive um, presentation. So I would like to call on the commission, whoever has any questions. Commissioner Bernie. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to second that compliment on the presentation, really very good and very thorough. Um, obviously lots of issues and lots of problems to overcome and I'm sure over time it will start to work itself out. These things are not solved overnight and I think as we get more experience then we'll find more solutions. So I'm pretty optimistic about the long-term outcome. I just did have one question about this issue of uh, I mean, obviously, the structures that we have now, they're pretty slapdash and, and, you know, cheap and quick and dirty, right? And obviously, they were put up in a hurry during the pandemic. Um, when we move into a more permanent situation, I can see vendors, restaurants being far more willing to invest in much better structures, more permanent, more better looking, better designed, and so on. But that may be in conflict with this idea about seasonal removal. Are we really going to be asking them to spend a lot of money on a much better structure and then have them take it down so that we can clear the snow? That might be something we need to think about a little bit. Uh, that was just one quick thought, but thank you for the rest of it. I can take uh, 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 that question. Thank you, commissioners. Carolyn Grossman, um, uh, uh, appreciate the, the feedback. Um, this is a, a, an issue that the, I think the teams are rightly giving a lot of thought to. Um, it really is critical that the, um, that the setups on the roadway be removable, um, both um, legally, uh, it is required that they that we not have permanently affixed structures in in the roadway, uh, as well as as a practical consideration for all of the road work, uh, utilities work um, that that may need to occur uh, in the sidewalk, as well as some other issues like cleanliness um, uh, that that have come up, up along the program. So we do think it's really important that they be removable. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say we don't think it is uh, uh, impossible to have. Uh, creative, incredible, inspiring uh, design 
in a removable context. And we have seen many examples of that in our streets as well, but we agree that it's not, that there are many right now that are not fully removable. And so I think part of the work that we will be doing as we engage in the next uh, steps with the design community is thinking about uh, uh, how to encourage um, the best of design with removability. And just to give you a few examples of things we have seen, water barriers are things that are both heavy enough to be safe and light enough to be removable when they are empty. Um, we have seen, um, of course, some are using construction uh, uh, barriers, but there are examples out there of much more creative and aesthetically interesting uses of, of, of water barriers that is something that we want to explore. We've seen shading and, uh, and, and, um, uh, and screening that is not permanently affixed but allow you know using fabric and other tensile materials that are much easier to remove but 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 similarly have a lot of aesthetic value so we think that there's a lot of things that can be encouraged and continue to develop that vernacular while also making the streets ultimately available when con ed has a gas leak and needs to come in right. um and 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 take and take sidewalk up that those two things should not be in mm -hmm. um in contradiction Right. So, so just to say, then your design guidelines should make it clear that these need to be demountable structures, and they'll they'll build that into whatever design they're doing. So that's fine. yes. Mm -hmm. And and many startups, as as Eric noted, many may need to modify. But we think that there's, um, you know, that may, that that a lot of the good ones are going to be able to modify within reason. Right. There's still the perimeter barriers may be very similar, but you may need to take down some of the overhead structure and rethink how that's handled, mm -hmm. for instance. Good, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, yes, you, you mentioned at, at the tail end, um, Benjamin, about fees um, and, you know, and, and I hadn't heard much about it in the beginning. What is the, what are you thinking about in terms of a fee structure or did I misunderstand what the so plan is? Yeah, Ben, I can take this one. Um, sure. So DOT is working um, closely now with OMB um, and City Hall to come up with a fee structure for the program that um, City Hall has made it very clear that they want this program to be affordable and accessible to um, as many restaurants as possible. So cheaper than the um, current sidewalk cafe program, but still something that we're looking into and don't um, know the exact details of what the fee will be. Is there any guidance that this be revenue neutral? I mean, many of these are parking spaces on commercial streets that um, you know are park or pay for parking spaces. Um, so, are we as a city? I mean, we have some budget issues as a city because of COVID to begin with, and I, I would hate for this to impact. You know, I would like it to be revenue neutral, and I would like to see um, an analysis of that. So, whatever the fee is. Um, you know, enables us to make that determination. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And we are having um, our uh, some economists that we have here at DOT working on that analysis um, right now. Great. Um, so the other thing is, you know, I, I also share the concerns. I, I share my excitement about this because I, I think this is really valuable, you know, and I, I also share concerns about the conditions of these structures. And, and you know, the other day I was walking around and my neighborhood in, in Queens and and I took a picture of a fully enclosed structure with locked doors that was being used for storage by the restaurant. I mean, it's clearly in, in flagrant violation, um, you know, and and so it, could you just speak in really layman's terms? What what can a community do, I guess, to prevent an actor from doing, I think, I think paying for the space will actually be important because you value something you pay for. So we'll say that, but, you know, to prevent an actor who might have a proclivity towards, you know, a crappy, crappy outdoor space or after it's in place, you know, what, where does the community um, have a say on one side, either before or after? Um, and is this, technically as of right, or could you explain the, it's not as of right if the community can squash an application. So I just wanna understand just the community's role. So I, I can start and Carolyn, if you wanna jump in on, on anything I may miss. Um, so it is not as of right, the temporary program is, um, and I think you're right that once the um, 
community and once the restaurants rather are paying for this space that they will be a little bit more um they'll be adhering to the rules in a better way with that said we also will have a much stricter enforcement um team and stricter enforcement guidelines when the permanent program is in place so right now you know we have you know that the restaurants are suffering and and we have been enforcing um but have not been um up until recently, have not been giving fines or removing structures. We are starting to do that now for the most egregious actors. Um, but in the permanent program, uh, restaurants that are not following the rules will be given fines, will be removed, depending on um, the the um, uh, depending on what what they're they're not adhering to. Um, so I think that's that's the first thing. And then, um, Carolyn, do you want to talk a little bit about the communities? Um, involvement. Sure. So, so Commissioner, I think the way we understand it, um, uh, it, it, it's a little different than zoning. There's no, there's no as of right condition here because the city will ultimately have to affirmatively choose to give a license and a, re of a revocable consent to an entity. But that power will lie with DOT, which is required to refer an application on an advisory basis to community boards. So I, while DOT will, you know, does not have to give out the, the license, I think the presumption will be that, that applications that are consistent with the, the guidance of the program, unless they're sort of documented bad actors, will be given the presumption of, of approval. Um, the, so the community board does not have the, you know, an effective veto over, over a cafe. That being said, under the DCWP program, as well as any other program where, ref where referrals are provided to community boards, evidence and information that the community board provides will be taken seriously by the, app by the, by the grantee. And, and there's, no, um, there's no absolute requirement that DOT uh, provide that licensure uh, in the future. So, um, you know, we can come back and, and, and sort of talk about this, but I think what we're, what we're anticipating is, um, you know, where there may be uh, documented cases of abuse, right, uh, of, you know, a, a restaurant coming in that um, had many noise complaints in the past or, 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 or particular, um, you know, notorious, um, you know, uh, sanitation challenges, that those are all pieces of information that could ultimately affect the, the review. However, it will not be in the community board's um, purview, let's say, to say, um, you know, a cafe can't be set up in a way that is consistent with the rules and guidelines that are put forward by the program, just as it wasn't under DCWP. If you're consistent, you know, if the if the if there are promulgated rules for how much space, what kinds of setups that you should have, that that those would be the those would be the guiding rules of the program in all conditions. So that's and, and before, but once they're and and I, I understand that as a as right I mean if they generally follow the rules they're generally generally going to be able to get approval um, once they're in place what what role does a community board potentially have in raising concerns and elevating those concerns um, about you know bad actors yeah, I think you know raising the concerns to DOT and to our borough offices will be a, a big part of this program and I think you know working the community boards working in in um working with our borough offices um and then the borough offices passing it along to our inspection team and because now we'll have a dedicated team that is really just for this program um we'll be able to go out and inspect much faster than we have been I mean I I would I would like there to be a way in which you know a community can you know absolutely have some some say afterwards you know right now it seems like it's discretionary right they you know their their approval is is advisory um you know they have significant concerns afterwards which are legitimate about noise and disruption um you know again it's discretionary um you know under what conditions do we say that absolutely you know if they do not do xyz and alleviate these complaints or concerns that the, the location, a problematic location will be shut down. You know, I, I'd like to understand that because I think, I think we're going to have, we're letting this, you know, we're letting this happen across the entire city and we're going to have many, many instances where we need a lever 
um, the city and communities need a lever to be able to shut someone down. Um, and I think we're going to want that. And, and, you know, you're going to have to jump over hoops. It's, <laughs> you know, the, but I, I think we have to retain that right and communities need to somehow be able to participate and enforce that discussion. Thank, thank you for the for the comments, Commissioner. We can certainly take that back. I think, again, just to confirm, DOT will have the right to shut down bad actors, and the communities will have the ability to provide that information that informs DOT, right? So that, you know, I think that's the, the principle that we're working for is to make is make sure that that information flow about potential violations is getting to the place and to the inspectors and the decision teams that need it. And that that review is happening on the on, on on the right level of basis with enough teeth that DOT can act on that information. Um, I think what you're describing is something that's sort of more mandatory, like you know something beyond you know noise code violations will affect the review of whether you get to continue, but rather like a three strikes yeah. out policy. Yeah, or precisely. Uh, just some much clearer guidance on on what you have to adhere to for both the. The restaurant to know, you know, I have to comply or else, um, yeah. because otherwise I just see a lot of conflict. And, and, um, and just to confirm again, the rules said under DCWP and will say in the future that you have to you have to comply with the noise code. So that that we are trying to make extraordinarily clear that violations won't be tolerated and that under the future licensure program, the enforcement will be souped up around that. We have not talked about you know, how many violations will result in a forfeiture. We've just said that the violation is not, is, is a violation of your license. So I think, what it. we're, you know, it's, it, I, I would just want to distinguish making the rules clear from making the um, acceleration of sort of punitive measures def, you know, mandatory versus flexible. But I think it's 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 a good point. I think I think it's defining a threshold that you know we a baseline threshold that we acknowledge. If you've gotten ten to fifteen complaints, you know, or et cetera, because I think, sure. think a community wants a little bit more say. But thank you, I appreciate that, Carolyn. Commissioner Levin. Yes, thank you. Just following along on that line of questioning, it occurs to me, is there going to be a term to these licenses? If the license has to come up for renewal, uh, that could be an effective way of forcing the review that um, Commissioner Ortiz is correctly um, yeah. seeking to b bake into the process. Yes, so there will be a renewal. Um, you'll have to reapply um, every year, but there will be an, uh, every four years, but there will be an every year um, uh, relook from the DOT team. So DOT will relook at the application and make sure that everyone is in compliance and has been doing the right thing. And, and if they are not, then come back to the restaurant and, you know, either work will, with the restaurant or terminate. Will the four year renewals be referred to the community board? Or the community board yes. be told that the renewal process is uh, yes. uh, underway? And if you have any issues, please let us know. Yep. Good. And, Thank you. And another thing, you know, we occurred to us as we were going through the public review process is that when the restaurants go for their liquor license, they'll have to kind of describe to the community how they plan to use their outdoor dining. Um, and so there'll, there'll be an opportunity for them to ask a lot of questions um, about how the outdoor dining setup will happen in the liquor license application as well. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Rompershout. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I had some of the same similar comments that Commissioner uh, Ortiz had and Commissioner Eleven had. Uh, I do also share um, uh, excitement and concern. But one of the things I'm, I'm wondering or thinking about, and I brought this up the last time this came up, was I know DOT is planning and hiring additional inspectors, examiners. I was just wondering, I, I see that it was 11,500 restaurants that participated according to this, uh, uh, the slideshow that we have. As of today, do you know how many of those would not be in compliance? And I'm worried, I'm just a little concerned about the, the enforcement and in terms of the number of inspectors that will be hired to, I guess, supervise and maintain. Is there a like, criteria already formed? Like they're going to come out every 30 days, 60 days, if, if uh, restaurants are non-compliance and issue them a, I guess, a warning to bring it in. Is there any idea how that's going to work? Uh, we are still putting together um, exactly what 
what their roles will be um, and exactly how that will work. Um, we do have the number of not in compliance, but I don't have it for you this second, um, but I can get that to you. And let me ask another just general hypothetical situation. I'll give you two. Okay. If I'm a restaurant, I'm under an elevated train, Liberty Avenue, Roosevelt Avenue, Jamaica Avenue, and I have, I'm utilizing the street and MTA wants to do track work. How would that be coordinated? Because I live, on, I live right off of Jamaica Avenue. I see a lot of restaurants and they were doing a lot of track work and I don't know how they're coordinating with restaurants. How are you guys uh, anticipating that move? And another situation, just a hypothetical, because I work in the architectural field as well. You have a restaurant next door to me that's utilizing it. I'm doing a new building next door. I got to put up a sidewalk shed. How would that impact the adjacent neighbor? If I had to do a street closing for new construction, I'm doing a 20-story building, 10-story bill, how would that affect? Is that also being thought of in these rules and regulations that you're going to be putting out in, I guess, 2022 or 2023? Yes, um, it is being thought out. And we are really looking right now at you know priorities throughout the street. And construction is obviously one of them. Um, one of the, so far through the temporary program, they've been restaurants or construction workers have been working with um, our inspection team and they've been kind of coordinating together through that. Um, obviously, with this becoming permanent, it needs to be a much um, simpler, seamless process. And one of the things that will be in the in our application is um, uh, information and also um, a consent from the restaurants that if work needs to be done, um, there will need to be some coordination between um, between the construction companies, uh, DOT, and the restaurants. And just my last comment or question. With regards to the application process, if I'm a new business owner, I apply, uh, do you, does DOT already have, and I assume they do, the width of every street sidewalk in the city of New York? Is that something that you have inside in, in your database? So how do you, how do you confirm that if I have a 15-foot sidewalk, do you need the, app, the applicant to provide a survey, or is that something you guys have in your system already? So, so I can take that. It's actually something that DCP and DOT have been working together on throughout COVID. It would be nice if we had that perfect map of the city, but sidewalk conditions change um, even within an individual block, sometimes based on private, uh, 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 private construction as well. So the city does not have a perfect map of, of curb to building line uh, sidewalk widths. After, uh, as a result of some data work that's been done during COVID, we have a pretty good map that we've been using for estimates uh, for this, uh, for the work that we've been doing here, as well as other uh, sidewalk uh, and, and, and open street planning through the city. Um, however, um, um, it's not just the curb to building uh, uh, width, as you know, it's the nature of the obstructions that appear on it. And there are some that we are able to map effectively, and there are others that we may miss. Um, and so it will still be reliant on uh, an individual applicant to be part of self-certifying the obstructions that are out there. There may be there may be times where community input um, affects that, right? That oh, the diagram missed, you know, a, a, a hydrant at this location that's really salient for details. Or there may be times where in uh, in person inspections affect that as well. But ultimately it's going to be a combination of the city's own data resources, which we think can help and create some base information that hadn't existed in the pre-COVID period, but, it's, it, but it will need to be supplemented by, um, you know, individual site information. You may have, you may just tell them to just get a, maybe an architectural survey or something like that, just, just to help you guys out with that situation. Uh, the, the goal is to make, is to try and not require um, engineering and professional expertise as part of the application process, because we know that that's been an expense borne by restaurants in the past. Yeah. So if possible, we're looking uh, uh, to make to make that to lessen that through technology and site planning that can be done at a more lay level. But yes, that that is always a possibility that there may be circumstances where that's required. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional questions from the commission? for this item. Well, seeing none, this is on for a hearing on Wednesday. We expect that there'll be very keen interest and lots of people talking about this, this item on Wednesday. So be prepared.
The 11th item on our agenda is a scope determination uh, for a proposed modification to the Elevate Transit Zoning for Accessibility Zoning Text Amendment. Uh, Angela Belicio is here to discuss. Angela? Yeah, hello. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thank you for having us back again today to update you on the Zoning for Accessibility proposal. Um, on September 10th, ZFA was presented at the City Council Zoning Subcommittee meeting. Uh, the Zoning Subcommittee then voted to approve the citywide text with modifications on September 24th. The City Council Land Use Committee uh, approved the proposal with modifications on September 30th, and the full City Council will vote on the proposal this Thursday, October 7th. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the City Council is proposing three modifications to the Zoning for Accessibility proposal. The first modification is to the annual reporting criteria of the system-wide easement requirement. Under the proposed text amendment, the transit agency will submit to the chairperson of the CPC an annual report that contains an inventory of all easement volumes established through ZFA and their status. The proposed city council modification would also add the city council to the list of recipients of the MTA's annual easement program report. The second city council modification is in regard to improvements that are eligible for the bonus. As proposed, the expanded transit improvement bonus program would allow for accessibility or capacity, capacity enhancing improvements and additional environmental design upgrades as eligible improvements for bonus floor area. The proposed city council modifications would clarify that resiliency improvements are included among the types of, accessible, of acceptable upgrades that could be provided in addition to accessibility or capacity enhancing improvements for bonus floor area. And finally, the city council is proposing a limitation to the floor area bonus authorization. Under the proposed text amendment, the floor area bonus of up to 20% may be granted through a CPC authorization. The proposed city council modification would establish an additional limitation of 200,000 square feet of additional floor area for sites under the proposed authorization mechanism. It would also establish a special permit for a floor area bonus of up to 20% without limitation to overall square footage. We believe these modifications are within the scope um, and do not require additional review of land use or environmental issues. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions from the commission? So seeing none, the request here, oh, sorry, Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify the third item, the, the 200,000 square foot uh, limitation. Would you reiterate uh, that requirement again, please? Sure. Um, the Under the proposed tax amendment, um, a floor area bonus of up to 20% uh, may be granted through a CPC authorization. Um, so the proposed city council modification um, would establish, establish an additional limitation of 200,000 square feet of additional floor area um, for the proposed authorization mechanism. Um, and if you are asking for a floor area bonus of um, greater than 200,000 square feet, um, you, you would have to um, apply for a special permit. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, we're asked to send a scope determination letter to the city council. And so all of those uh, commissioners in favor, please say or indicate aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Okay. Then this will be sent on to the city council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 12th item on our agenda is a scope determination of a proposed modification to the Windermere special permit application. Uh, here to discuss is Asken Mohideen. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as you may recall, this application by Windermere Properties LLC for a special permit pursuant to section 74711 of the zoning resolution was approved by the City Planning Commission on August 18, 2021. The application facilitates the renovation and conversion of a historic landmark building into a mixed use building with commercial, retail, and residential use. On September 30th, the City Council voted on the application and has proposed draft modifications. Next slide, please. The Commission approved a use waiver to permit either hotel or office use within the proposed commercial floor area. The City Council modification would restrict the use waiver to remove the Scheme A hotel use option and only permit the Scheme B office use. The, 
the department has reviewed the proposed changes and determined that these proposed modifications raise no land use or environmental issues requiring further review. Um, happy to answer your questions. Are there any questions from the commission? If not, this is a request for a scope determination letter to be sent to the city council. Uh, all of those in favor, please indicate uh, yay. Aye. Yay. Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, so we'll send this on to the city council. Thank you. Okay, moving on to future votes for consideration on, on October 6, 2021. Staff have prepared reports for uh, 624 Morris Avenue, uh, Stevenson Commons. I'll note that Commissioner Marin is recused. Uh, the CB8 office space lease, the Gowanus Canal CSO. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, I'm also recused on Stevenson Commons. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll add you. Thank you. Um, 824 Metropolitan Avenue, uh, Commissioner Ron Pashad is recused on this item. Uh, Cooper Park Commons, Las Reyes, 18517 17 Hillside Avenue. And then also scheduled for vote on Wednesday is the Riverdale Park 233rd Street DEP pump station, which is a natural area uh, authorization Bronx. Uh, staff are preparing reports uh, for October 18th. Uh, consider uh, 1045 Atlantic Avenue and 175 Park Avenue. Commissioners Marin and Cirillo are recused on this item. Uh, for post hearing follow ups, um, we have wind powers. If there are any further questions on that, let me know. Uh, 506rd Avenue. Likewise, um, the stair at Lehigh and Terminal Warehouse. Further questions? No. Uh, the fresh update text amendment. This is a citywide text. Uh, Jesse and Barry are here. If there are any further questions, I believe we don't have any staff initiated follow up on this one. Uh, the help and fitness text amendment, uh, Dylan Sandler uh, is here with an update. Dylan? Uh, I'm actually going to turn it over to Nick Moore, who's going oh, to give okay. a brief that's update. That's right. Nick, yeah. Nick had the one who did all the homework on this. So <laughs> uh -huh. Nick, Nick Moore is here to, to give all the uh, follow-up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Great. Great. Um, my name is Nicholas Moore, and we're here as a post-hearing follow-up to answer any remaining questions on the health and fitness citywide text amendment and to announce a modification to the proposed zoning text. During public hearing, we received six oral testimonies, two public comments, and one written testimony from a diversity of industries in favor of the proposal with zero in opposition. During review session, we heard some concerns about licensed massage therapy in residential districts and enforcement of illegal activity. Throughout the development of the proposal, we have been in contact with the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement, who are tasked with inspection of potentially illegal establishments and issue relevant violations. We have communicated with them once again following review session to discuss those concerns and have assembled the following responses. <clears throat> the proposal would not be more permissive of unlicensed massage therapy. The existing PCE special permit does not prevent people from starting illegal businesses, and the proposal maintains the ability to enforce against illegal businesses. Including community boards review to the siting of massage providers would not aid in enforcement against illegal massage businesses because they would not go through the approval process. The proposal would not allow licensed massage therapy facilities to be sprinkled within residential buildings. <clears throat> as with other ambulatory healthcare facilities, if located in a building with residences, 
they would be limited to ground floor locations or a separately accessed second story location. <clears throat> Rather than a hindrance to an enforcement, the proposal is an improvement because OSE will no longer have will, will no longer have to uh, prove the absence of a special permit or the gender of the massage provider. Under the proposal, OSE can issue a violation for operating as an unlicensed physical treatment establishment or operating without or contrary to a certificate of occupancy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> in further evidence of the proposal's concerns on enforcement and working relationship with the mayor's office of special enforcement, the agency requested a modification to the definition of unlicensed physical treatment establishment to ensure that the city retains the existing enforcement capability related to unlicensed massage. <clears throat> the change would incorporate language that currently exists within the definition of adult physical care establishments and would clarify that businesses may not offer, advertise, or be equipped to provide massage by anybody who is not a licensed massage therapist. Uh, next slide, please. And that concludes our uh, follow-up presentation today, and uh, we are available for questions. Are there any questions from the commission? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Commissioner Bernie. Uh, just a comment, really, you know, since I was one of the people who were raising issues about the um, <clears throat> massage parlors becoming, you know, sex parlors, uh, I mean, I'm slightly reassured by what you said. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm wholly reassured, <laughs> uh, but I guess, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I would like to be convinced that this text change does, in fact, improve enforcement, um, but I think it remains to be seen, and I remain somewhat apprehensive about it in residential neighborhoods. Thank you. Commissioner Cerullo. I, I, I just, um, I, not so much a question either, like Commissioner Bernie, I just want to, uh, I, I want to acknowledge um, the sort of the update and, and some of the changes that have been made um, to try to deal with some of the concerns. I, I'm not, I mean, enforcement is a completely different animal. It always is. Um, but, you know, when we think about how horrendous, you know, uh, the administration thinks hotels are to our communities and that we need a special permit for that, I'm not so sure this is the worst thing to, that we could be doing, um, but I, I do want to thank uh, the staff and the work uh, that the administration has put into trying to create language to address some of the concerns that were raised. I'm, I'm not sure where I land on this at the moment, but uh, I didn't uh, want the presentation and the update to go without acknowledgement. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from the commission? Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna actually jump back up. I just wanted to note that uh, on 1045 Atlantic Avenue, there we did receive the borough president's recommendation uh, that was in your package. Um, uh, there, are, So I wanted to draw attention to that. Um, okay. And then on 175 Park, I've been in, informed that Commissioner Marin is is not recused on that one. That was uh, the change of change of uh, of, uh, of conditions there. All right. Um, moving on, we have the uh, citywide hotel tax amendment. Uh, Alex Plakis is here with an update. Alex. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Alex Plakis. I work in the Housing and Economic Development Division, uh, and I'm just here for the follow-up for uh, the Citywide Hotel Special Permit. Uh, next slide, please. Just uh, to go over this again, the proposed tax amendment would create a new city, new special permit for hotel development citywide. It is intended to create a consistent framework for hotel development 
ensure that hotels do not negatively affect the surrounding area. Next slide, please. So the purpose and need is to ensure that there is a consistent zoning framework for new hotels that will support more predictable development. Next slide, please. So the applicable areas of the new special permit appear in the pinkish purple color and the areas with existing hotel special permits are in the grid. Zone districts where hotels are currently allowed will require a special permit for any new hotels and conversions. This includes higher density commercial districts, mixed use districts and paired m one districts. The proposed citywide special permit will replace existing special district special permits and the proposal would apply to the new special Gowanus mixed use district approved by the city planning commission. Uh, the proposed modification to remove this uh, hotel special permit and the citywide hotel special permit will apply. And the existing M1 hotel special permit will retain its findings since those are specific to light industrial uses. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an update from when I, from the last uh, post hearing follow-up. Um, there's been an increase of two favorable votes, an increase of two favorable with condition votes, and an increase of one unfavorable vote. Uh, there's no changes at the borough board votes and two new conditional favorable votes were received from Manhattan and Queens. Next slide, please. So these are the follow-up items. Um, while, uh, the, while referring this out to the committee boards and through the public hearing, there are questions about the appropriateness of timing, and we have made modifications to the proposal and have examined other requested modifications. Next slide, please. And since we have last uh, met the commission, we also have uh, been working on a market study. Uh, this is an update from the new hotel market study. And in it, we have seen that hotel inventory has recovered from the lows of September of 2020. The return of inventory has been uneven across boroughs and subdistricts with Manhattan and especially Midtown lagging other markets. Uh, a recent Cranes article has mentioned the reopening of the Grand Hyatt and Midtown Hilton hotels, which contained approximately 1,300 and 1,900 rooms respectively. Those were not included in these figures yet. So Manhattan accounts for a majority of the hotel rooms throughout the city and for a majority of its permanent closures at 95% of these permanent closures. 7,200 rooms have closed permanently in the city an increase from September of 2020. Uh, citywide occupancy and average daily rates have recovered, but still have not reached pre-pandemic levels. Due to Manhattan, having the majority of hotel rooms closely matches the citywide trends, but when compared to the other boroughs, we see that recovery is slower. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to speak on the appropriateness of timing. So it's anticipated that hotel demand will return to pre-pandemic levels in 2025 by both industry experts and New York City Office of Management and Budget. As demand for hotels, as demand for hotel rooms returns and potentially exceeds current inventory, the Department of City Planning believes that the trend seen over the last decade of rapid hotel development will resume. The proposal is appropriately timed in order to ensure that hotels do not develop and impair the future use and development of the surrounding area. Next slide, please. So uh, the modification to include new findings has been in response to community boards and others who have stated that the current finding is vague. Current findings are that the hotel use shall not impair the future use and development of the surrounding area. Uh, we have these are the proposed additional findings, and two of the these two are findings from the existing M1 special permit. These are applicable to a wide range of neighborhood contexts 
and that will provide additional guidance. These would be uh, a site plan to incorporate elements to address any potential conflicts uh, between the proposed hotel use and adjacent uses, which would include access and egress. And then such hotel use would not cause undue vehicular or pedestrian congestion. Next slide, please. We have also proposed some changes to the vesting provisions. A review of the status of filed and certified applications from June 30th of 2021 indicates that several projects may not have the required approvals in time to meet vesting and exclusion criteria and may require additional time to obtain approval and flexibility to modify their proposal. Although the, although the department assumed most filed applications would vest by the date of adoption, the text amendment, many projects have not had sufficient time to process applications. The Department of City Planning is proposing to extend by one year the time allowed for hotels in the Department of Building permitting process to attain plan approval or, for, or foundation permits in order to vest. We also are proposing to allow vested projects to increase floor area by up to 20%, provided that the increase does not exceed the hotel floor area permitted by the underlying zoning. And then for uh, boards of standards and appeals projects, divesting of filed applications that were approved prior to January 1st of 2018, but including those filing for an extension before adoption. These modifications will not expand the universe of projects that invest, but give projects who have worked in good faith time to reach the above milestones. Next slide, please. If these are other requested modifications. Department of City Planning is uh, proposing that are not adopted. I'll be mentioned in both the public hearing and when meeting with community boards. So uh, a sunrise, uh, Department of City Planning analyzed and determined this alternative wasn't consistent with the purpose and need. A one-year sunrise would not provide meaningful mitigation and many of the projects that would benefit would also benefit from the proposed changes uh, to vesting. A six-year sunrise also is not consistent with the purpose of need because it could lead to more rapid hotel development in the near future where the conflicts um, that this proposal aims to address may pop up. Uh, there's a sunset provision that the Department of State Planning analyzed and also determined isn't consistent with the purpose of need. Uh, the commission has established a sunset for zoning provisions in the past, such as the 1982 rezoning of West Midtown, where permissive provisions were adopted for a limited time with the intent of spurring near-term investment prior to the sunset. That pattern does not hold with this current proposal. So while the commission has the ability to revisit zoning provisions in the future as conditions warrant, there's no, con there's no expectation at present that the rationale for the current proposal would expire in several years. Since visitation is projected to return to pre-pandemic levels at or about the time sunset would take effect, it's expected that the conditions driving hotel construction patterns today would resume. A geographic exclusion was also studied and the Department of City Planning analyzed and determined it is not consistent with the purpose and need of the proposal because it would create an inconsistent regime across the city. It could incentivize undue concentration of hotel development in the excluded areas as greater numbers of hotels develop in locations that house a limited share of the existing inventory. Next slide, please. If there are any questions, um, I, Chen Gravel, and I believe Howard Slatkin are all uh, more than happy to take. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, are there any questions from the commission? Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I guess, um, and, and thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, 
I, well, in a, in a way, it's more of a more of comments, but I guess there are questions sort of built built into to them in, into the comments. But I, I find it interesting that the sort of uh, the section of this update with respect to the hotel inventory, I guess, I think that was the, the title of the, of the page, sure. really helped to build the case what you have of how really, how I devastated the, the, the industry is, particularly in Manhattan um, and in Midtown, which I, I have a great understanding of, that the number of permanent closures fell in the borough um, and, and obviously occupancy, while much improved over time, is still nowhere near uh, the pre-COVID levels, which we all know. Um, but yet th that sort of unfortunate data <laughs> is being used to then justify the continued process that from a timing point of view at some point this is all going to change so we should really just do this now so we can get to review these things when they when the world is back to normal and i mean that we could say that about anything then and so i just and and we haven't talked at all about what we believe the cost to be um there hasn't been any reference to the fact that even representatives of the industry wouldn't want this to apply to them if there was obviously not possible. But the idea that if they had to come back through this process, they themselves wouldn't want this to apply to them. Um, and so I, 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 I appreciate the fact that we went back to look at this, the department went back to look at this, but I, I, I feel like in a way, it's only really provided information to sort of help support the fact that this isn't the time to do it. And, you know, the added findings, great. Um, I don't think it does anything more to help us get past the how we determine that a hotel development shall not impair the development of the surrounding area. Um, but I, I just want to share that, um, my thoughts on it, since I know I've had opinions about this, but I, I want to thank you for that work. I, I just find the information provided sort of to help support <laughs> the point of view I had in the first place that this is, you know, probably not necessary, number one. And two, if there ever was a time to be necessary, it isn't now. And so, um, and I guess, I guess we'll see where this goes, but, but thanks again for your continued work on it. Um, I do appreciate that. Um, but I, I'm, actually grateful to see some of the data that you're providing, even though some of it I had a sense of already. Um, but this is, um, I think, helpful, at least for me, in terms of continuing to form my, my final opinion on this action. So thank you. Thanks, Fred. Do you guys have, you want to respond or you don't feel the need? Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced what we lose by implementing a sunset provision. Uh, it gives us the ability to, over time, study the real world data, see where this pandemic goes, and basically look back and see how many hotel applications came in over time. And as you noted, the commission can vote to extend it at, at a future date. So I'm not convinced that the that, that a sunset provision doesn't is not warranted in this in this case. So you can speak more to it, or if you have any further comments on it. Hello, Commissioner. Um, I 
hope to be able to respond a little bit to that, um, the, to, to your inquiry. The question of sunset provisions generally has come up um, a handful of times before the commission. Um, and as uh, Alex noted in, in, in the presentation, there is one instance where we have implemented it. Um, when we look at the idea of a sunset provision, um, you know, there are some concerns that we have to uh, uh, evaluate. One is the extent to which it helps or hinders the predictability um, of regulations for the purpose of, of future investment. Um, and in the instance of the one sunset provision that we really have on uh, have had on the books, it has since, of course, sunsetted. But uh, it was in, it actually put in place for the particular purpose of changing the predictability of future investment or, or creating some, some, some future greater predictability by ensuring that the higher FARs that were created in West Midtown in 1982 expired at a set point in order to spur investment before the sunset date uh, to sort of bring people into action here. And I think that, you know, the comparison to the current situation is a difficult one to make because in this instance, what we're really talking about is looking at conditions again at a point in the future uh, to make sure that the determination that was made at some point in the past is still valid. And that is a, 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 an issue that comes up with many, many decisions before the commission. And I think that we have in the past been loath to encourage the commission to um, incorporate sunsets when in fact, zoning can be reevaluated without any further sort of mechanisms built into the into the zoning. If something is not working in the zoning, it can be revisited and modified. And of course we have instances where that has happened in the past. So this is why we have recommended that the sons of provision would not um, be consistent with the nature of the proposal. But then how do we mitigate the adverse effects identified? Uh, I mean, I believe the sunset provision will give us the real wood data that we need to, to make the decision um, and, and not to have any adverse effects. You know, I think the, the, the elements of the proposal that address vesting and projects in the pipeline are certainly oriented towards minimizing uh, adverse effects of the proposal on investments in progress that would play out during this period of time. And then, you know, I think the issue of continuing to monitor and if, if something is having uh, effects that are considered undesirable in the future, uh, you know, the zoning can be revisited and modified uh, at a future date. I, I thank you for the clarification, but I'm, I'm still not convinced that without the sunset provision, this is a viable, um, a viable <coughs> thing to put forward. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I just, it's so long since we took a look at this. I, you know, find myself, I'm in the pretty much the same camp as um, Commissioner Cirillo. Um, everything we've heard, um, I realize you've been working valiantly to push this one along. But um, the presentation really reinforces for me the concern that this is really an economic protectionist move for the hotel, the established hotel industry. And that's not a land use issue. That's a something else kind of issue. Um, and then the other strong theme that we heard in the public hearings were about communities um, wanting to have a say on development in their neighborhoods, um, which really goes to the whole much bigger question of comprehensive planning doesn't have much to do with hotels. So um, I too remain in pretty much the same place I was when we um, last looked at this one. Just thought I'd put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, you know, I, I continue to have concerns and, and, you know, others have said it, but I think, you know, to, to let you know where I stand as well, you know, I, I do think, I continue to think that the premise that hotels, um, particularly in our CBDs, I just don't, uh, you know, we've acknowledged that there are issues in the outer boroughs, but, you know, the, the premise that they create conflicts with adjacent uses and affect hotel guest safety, you know, in our CBDs when they are routine commercial uses found in cities, I, I find very difficult to, um, 
you know, sort of accept that that, that premise is, um, and, you know, to require a full, full Euler. Um, based on that, I just, I simply can't get behind. So I'm sort of in the same place that I was before as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission? Not, thank you team for that presentation and follow up. Right. Uh, moving on, we have uh, 250 Water Street. Uh, Stephen Johnson is here with an update, I believe. Yes, hi. Good Excuse afternoon. Um, 250 Seaport District LLC is proposing three modifications to their application. So the application was certified on May 17th. They filed an amended application on August 2nd and the public hearing was September 1st. So these proposed new modifications have not yet been filed, uh, but given the constraints of the ULERP clock, we thought uh, the department wanted to brief you all as soon as possible. So the first um, modification, uh, the applicant has had conversations with potential tenants regarding the possible development of a university theater within the building. University and theater uses are permitted by the underlying zoning. Underlying zoning. Uh, the applicant is proposing to revise the application to permit theater use, either as the primary use or accessory to the university uses. Um, second, uh, the applicant is also proposing to make some changes related to the floor area calculations. So the certified application would have permitted the distribution of approximately 256,000 uh, square feet of unused development rights from Pier 17 to the development site, and the additional transfer of 30,216 square feet of development rights from the Seaport Development Rights Bank. Uh, given that the floor area has been reduced from the maximum of 599, thousand feet to approximately 547,000 square feet. Uh, the transfer from the Seaport Development Rights Bank is no longer needed and the applicant is withdrawing the request for the commission certification and the associated zoning text amendment. Uh, the third modification uh, is related to uh, permitted obstructions on the terraces. Next slide, please. So this is an order to accommodate canopies, kitchenettes, sunshades, sports equipment, and other tenant amenities that might not be listed in the zoning resolution. So the original application uh, requested a maximum building height of 395 feet as approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. That is reflected in the A application. The proposed building would permit a maximum height of 324 feet. So in order to accommodate these uh, proposed amenities on the terraces, the applicant is proposing additional obstructions up to a height of 15 feet in selected areas on the terraces. And any such obstructions would be back, set back at least 10 feet from the building's perimeter in order to limit visibility from the street and would be subject to review and approval by LPC. Next slide, please. So these are the terraces and the locations uh, of the terraces for the permitted obstructions. Uh, next slide, please. And that's looking east towards Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Uh, additionally, I wanna mention that the fifth floor terrace is for the office tenant use. The sixth floor, floor terrace is a residential amenity for all residents of the building, including any affordable units. And the 25th and 26th floor terraces are associated with individual residential unit owners. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Stephen. Are there any questions from the commission? Well, seeing none, thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you. Next, uh, Soho NoHo. Uh, we have Sylvia is here to discuss further post-hearing follow-up. Good afternoon, Chair Laramont, commissioners. So as a follow-up for the public hearing, as well as the first post-hearing follow-up a couple of weeks ago, uh, we're bringing the topics of retail um, and arts back to you as the main agenda items for today's follow-up. Next slide. 
Um, yes, uh, so I'll walk through a short deck and then uh, we'll be available to address any questions or concerns you may have. Uh, next slide. Uh, on retail, um, as discussed at length previously, the proposal seeks to allow a broad range of uses appropriate in mixed use districts, including retail of varied sizes and types. This proposed allowance reflects the fact that Soho Noho has the building stock, transit access, and existing context to support a diverse set of establishments. Um, I'll note that removing the need for special permits to allow uses typically permitted as a right in similarly mixed use areas would also level the playing field for smaller businesses that have less resources for discretionary actions. Um, importantly, the proposal is also a recognition of the retail sector's contribution to the city's tax base, jobs, uh, shopping opportunities, tourism, um, as well as the lively street life. Um, equally as important though, as we've always said, um, it is to take the quality of life challenges in these highly mixed use neighborhoods seriously and develop creative solutions. Next slide. Um, at the hearing, the commission heard testimony about quality of life concerns around retail deliveries and solid waste management, as well as proposals by engaged local stakeholders, such as the Soho uh, Broadway Initiative, uh, NoHo Bowery stakeholders, and others. Um, having reviewed these comments in consultations with agencies, we now recommend that the commission consider a modification to the proposal that further fine tunes the retail rules and balances the need for broader allowance as well as quality of life considerations in zoning. Um, so the proposal for the mod is to introduce a new chairperson certification for significantly large stores, um, which would involve a coordinated review of a loading plan. Um, this additional review by the department uh, in consultation with the Department of Transportation would ensure that bigger stores are better neighbors and that they do not overwhelm the public realm and conflict with other users of our streets and sidewalks, including you know, residents who may live on the top, upper floors um, close to um, these large stores. Um, I'll note that the 25,000 square foot threshold here represents stores of significant size um, that have substantial loading needs um, and are generally reflective of the size of stores that have been the sources of, president, oh, sorry, of residents' complaints over the years in Soho and Noho. Uh, and particularly um, along the Broadway corridor. Um, I'll know that we're working on the specific zoning text language, um, but believe this is a step forward in addressing longstanding challenges in Soho Noho, which the commission is very familiar with as part of you know, not only the Soho Noho rezoning, but also as part of its review of special permit applications in the past. Beyond zoning, we are of course continuing discussions with agencies and stakeholders about additional long-term strategies, including how DOT and sanitation's broader initiatives can be leveraged to address local concerns in Soho Noho. I'm happy to speak more about those after the presentation, but um, on the issue of solid waste management, we think that the consolidation of Carter's as part of DSNY, um, uh, DSNY's commercial waste zone program will go a long way in reducing truck traffic and its related noise and sidewalk impacts in Soho Noho. Uh, next slide. Moving on to uh, the second topic. Um, at the last post-hearing follow-up session, we discussed the, the majority of the questions that came up on JLWQAs and the Arts Fund. Today, I'll focus on what the fund can accomplish and how the fund will be allocated. Next slide. As we've noted previously, the Arts Fund's goal is to promote the public presence of the arts and that it could go towards programmatic and capital support. Um, but what does that mean for Zoho Noho? Um, for example, the Arts Fund could provide funding for publicly oriented exhibitions and programming in and around Zoho Noho on top of the investment DCLA and the city already make uh, in this neighborhood. Um, in addition, the fund can be set up to support smaller scale capital projects that often cannot be funded by the city due to certain capital fund restrictions. Um, so here we see Soho Noho Arts Fund as an opportunity to fill a gap by allowing more nonprofit organizations or unincorporated arts collectives, as well as individual artists to, take, uh, to partake in 
you know, preserving, upgrading, expanding, and then acquire, acquiring uh, cultural spaces, including workspaces um, for local artists. Um, existing cultural assets in the neighborhood, such as the Soho Repertory Theater, the Performance Garage, Museum of Chinese in America, La Mama Theater, and the Galleria, as well as individual artists would, could, uh, would be able to take advantage of the Arts Fund. Um, organizations and artists looking to present projects in Soho Noho would also be eligible for funding. Next slide. Um, in terms of the funding administration, I'll note that the zoning text itself provides two possible structures. Um, it could be a fund that is administered by the city or DCLA, or one that is managed by a nonprofit designee under the city oversight. Much of the details, of course, exist outside of zoning and will continue to be fleshed out through city council review. Um, but as spelled out in a memo um, that we've included uh, in your Friday packages, um, as currently envisioned, the Soho Noho Arts Fund would be a dedicated funding stream um, and could be managed by a nonprofit designated by the city with deep roots in the community and experience in grant making. Um, here I'll note that Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, um, the Arts Council for the Borough of Manhattan, and a member of a previous, the previously convened Envision Soho Noho Advisory Group is one of such possible nonprofit partners to manage the fund. Um, in a given year, the fund administrator, in this case, you know, the city or the nonprofit partner, in a process very similar to the tried and true artists regrant models um, elsewhere in the city and, and nationwide will open funding applications to uh, uh, for projects and activities uh, in Soho and around in surrounding neighborhoods and engage in various activities uh, to promote the funding opportunity. Um, the allocation would be determined by a peer review panel of local artists and arts professionals organized by discipline and selected each year. Here in discussion with DCLA, we recognize that while the composition of the peer review panels and the uh, specific criteria for fund allocation each year would exist outside of zoning and need to be flexible enough to accommodate changing needs over time, it is nevertheless very important to tailor the model to fit the vision for Soho Noho specifically and ensure that voices of the local cultural communities are represented at the decision-making table. Um, those conversations are ongoing and, um, and uh, we'll um, move on to the next slide. Um, so before I wrap up, we'll note some miscellaneous zoning text adjustments we're working on in response to issues raised during ULERP. Um, these include uh, clarifying certain provisions so that the zoning text fully aligns with the intent of facilitating JLWQA to residential conversions in a streamlined, uncomplicated way if voluntarily sought. Um, also includes tweaking the finding language um, in the BSA special permit to more clearly define HBD's role um, in BSA's evaluation of those special permit applications related to MIH uh, in conversions. Happy to speak in more details about these tweaks if the commission has questions. Um, but with that, we're here for any questions and comments you may have. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, questions from the commission, uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, 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 Sylvia, re regarding the uh, retail uh, and the requirement for uh, a 20, 25,000 square foot um, assemblage or larger requiring a special permit. I'm just curious as, as to how did you arrive at the 25,000 square foot uh, size as opposed to 10,000, which we've employed in other M1 uh, uh, contexts. And um, I would think, you know, 10,000 is, larger than uh, the predominant, you know, retail sizes in Soho uh, right now. Uh, so how did, how did you arrive at the 25,000 square foot? Uh... Thanks, Vice Chair, for your question. Um, so first, I want to clarify that this is not a new special permit. It is a chairperson certification. Ah, um, so okay. it's a different type of process. Right. 
Right. Um, in terms of the 25,000 square foot threshold, um, as I mentioned, it really represents stores of significant size that have substantial loading needs. Uh, 25,000 square foot is also uh, a threshold that already exists in zoning um, uh, that is related to um, loading requirements uh, in M15 and M16 districts, which are the districts we're proposing here. Um, and then I'll, I'll say that it is generally reflective of the size of stores that have been the sources of complaints over the years in Soho Noho, I think. And also um, when we looked back in the special permit uh, applications that commission has considered in Soho Noho, um, most, uh, I think all of, most of the large retail applications where the commission imposed loading, kind of additional loading restrictions um, to address concerns have been stores that are over 25,000 square feet. Um, and I want to also mention that, you know, unlike your typical manufacturing M1 districts where, um, you know, retails of this over 10,000 square feet would be kind of relatively rare. Soho Noho is not a typical, you know, manufacturing district. It is a district that is a global retail designation, uh, des destination. And there are um, lots of stores um, of um, much bigger size um, that exist in Soho and Noho. Um, additional consideration is that in looking at the floor plate sizes, uh, especially along the Broadway corridor, we see you know, a lot of um, buildings have um, a single floor plate size of over 10,000 square feet. And it doesn't necessarily to us make sense to you know, kind of add additional process for one to have a single floor of retail store uh, in a historic district and having to chop up uh, storefronts in that regard. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yes, thank you all for the presentation. Um, Commissioner Knuckles got the first half of my question, but I think there's another question related to the um, large scale retail. Um, and that is shifting it from a um, special permit process requiring full public review to a chair certification. And I think the experience we've had with special permits in the past um, has demonstrated the power of local comment um, about some of these operations. And I think we've been able to adjust um, loading. We've learned from residents of um, the conditions that they're living through and the specific improvements that need to be required in connection with a particular location. So. I guess I just don't understand with all the other um, significant improvements that this uh, zoning proposal brings for the for reforming, updating, modernizing the Soho Noru zoning. I just don't understand. And we know that this 12, that, that the um, large scale special permit is very important to the local community. I just don't understand um, the tenacity um, or, or the resistance um, by the department to, um, uh, you know, making wanting to keep it in, not wanting to continue with the special permit because I th I just think that is um, an important piece to the community and it's part of the political reality of this thing and I think there is value in um, public review of these large scale retail spaces anyway and given everything else that's being accomplished here I would give that one up if I were the department of city planning. Um, and then just after that, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you for fleshing out the um, arts fund vision, giving us some examples of how the fund might be spent. I think there's still a lot more to talk about there, but I'm really heartened by the um, progress that you have made in um, imagining how this might work and particularly um, emphasizing the possibility of the role of a local not-for-profit in managing the fund and making the grants. So thank you for all that work. I know it's not been easy. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Levin. Um, I, 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 I just wanna, you know, kind of one quick response on the, the first line of questioning. I think, you know, we've learned a lot, as you said, through the public review of prior special permit applications, as well as the Soho Noho process, you know, there are common threads of, of concerns that keep coming up um, in ar around large retail. So I think we see this as a step forward to sort of codify 
um, ways in which the commission has find useful in addressing some of those concerns. Um, but your point is well taken. We understand that the, 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 the community values um, the ability to weigh in on you know, new um, large, large stores um, that come to Soho. Um, I, I do want to point out that you know the we the department finds the the findings of the large retail special permit are are not you know kind of um, so well suited um, that to address the actual concerns that the community have uh, in this particular context. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from the commission? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the special Brooklyn Navy Yard Connie is here with an update. Connie. Thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, Chair Lerma, Commissioners. Um, I'm here for a post-hearing follow-up item for the Brooklyn Navy Yard proposal for a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment. One of the topics of discussion that I had flagged at the time of certification related to the ground floor streetscape provisions. Collectively, these are a set of provisions that are intended to help ensure activation and vibrancy of the public streets and the public open spaces. Next slide. The certified text uh, contains a requirement that 50% of the ground floor be occupied by floor area. And at certification, the department and the applicant were still discussing the minimum depth of that required floor area, and we had not yet come to a resolution. Um, so there was a placeholder, placeholder in the text that allowed for a minimum depth uh, of 15 feet if a clear span was provided. The standard depth in the zoning resolution where non-residential uses are required at the ground floor is 30 feet. This is reflected in enhanced commercial districts and numerous special districts across the city. The department believes that the 30 foot minimum depth uh, is needed to help produce viable spaces for a wide range of uses, which may change over time, including a broad range of commercial uses. Next slide. However, the applicant has expressed a desire for additional flexibility for ground floor uses to be reduced in depth to as low as 15 feet. They believe that the ability to include some smaller spaces, specifically spaces that are more shallow in depth, may be more affordable and more attractive to a wider range of smaller users and would therefore support a more diverse and active ground floor condition. Next slide. So we have come to a compromise where the 30 foot minimum depth would be maintained in key locations and a minimum depth of 15 feet would be permitted in other locations. Next slide. This diagram shows where the 30 foot minimum depth would be required. Those are the building frontages that are highlighted in red. Um, as you can see, it's focused on the frontages that are closest to the public streets. Um, and in orange are the building frontages where a minimum depth uh, of 15 feet would apply. So if you look at the Navy Street site, which is on the left side of, the, of this diagram, you can see that the frontages closest to Navy Street uh, facing the public streets would have a 30 foot depth requirement. At the bottom of the image is the Flushing Avenue site, which would have the 30 foot minimum depth requirement for the entirety of the building frontages. And at the Barge Basin subdistrict in the upper right, this is the site that has the longest combined frontages along uh, public streets and open spaces. And we've chosen to concentrate the 30 foot required depth on the Southern Entrance Plaza, which is marked with a green star. Uh, this is where the public would enter the site at the intersection of Kenta Avenue and Clymer Street. And uh, in addition to that location, we've also chosen to focus the 30 foot depth um, along the building frontages that are most visible from that location, which you can see at the Barge Basin West site, the Southern portion of that is highlighted in red. Uh, the Northern portion of the Kent Avenue frontage, which you'll see has, um, is outlined in orange, is where the applicant envisions a curb cut for loading and vehicular access. So the 15 foot minimum depth requirement in that location would allow for associated logistics um, along the Northern portion of the parcel. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks very much, Connie. Um, are there any questions from the commission? Don't see any. Okay. Thank you, Connie. And uh, Chair Lermont, that uh, concludes the uh, New York City Planning Commission review session for Monday, 
October 4th, 2021. The time is 5.03 p.m. Chair, uh, b before we- Congratulations, uh, congratulations. <laughs> uh, absolutely, congratulations. Uh, Thank you all very much. I, I, I don't think I, I screwed up too badly today. <laughs> Uh, Chair, I had one question unrelated to the agenda today, but it's based right. on something that I read. Uh, last week, I read that the applicants for the site at 142nd, West 142nd Street and Riverside Drive in Community Board 9, West Harlem, had gone before the City Council, and I believe I, I read that they withdrew their application for an R9. Yes. That's correct. Now, my recollection is that when it came before us, when we voted, it was based on a, a, a uh, they had reduced their application to R8. So I'm, 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 how did it come before the council as an R9 if we had in fact voted on an R8 uh, uh, classification? So. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my understanding is that, that, that well, the commission right. modified it down to an R8. Uh, yes. And, and that's what we sent, and that was what was before the city council. And I would assume that it was a misprint in the, in the paper. We could, I could see if Melissa. No, that's, to... that's what I believe too. What yeah. was sent to the council was what we voted on, which was an R8. So right. they really were not withdrawing the R9 application. They were withdrawing the application that we had voted on at the commission. Mm -hmm. yep. there, so was a little were... there was a little confusion because we read that also. Yeah. And you know, we, they had not withdrawn it in the full robust way that they're supposed to do with respect to city planning. But we've straightened that all out now, so so it's withdrawn. It's withdrawn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just just checking. Okay. Thank you. And again, congratulations, Chair. Thank you. Okay. So I Bye guess everybody. hearing nothing more, we're we're adjourned, right? Yep. Okay. Bye. -bye. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay. Congratulations. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.